suggesting a new architecture language that somehow um, infects the kind of classical um, orders, or not the orders, but the classical um, hierarchy of building with new language of today, uh, to me seems like a really productive project because uh, like memes, you know, there's an obsolete language <laughs> or an arguably obsolete language that um, when you start to uh, develop this, this new kind of hybrid, it's, uh, I think it's a really productive project. Also using three, you know, in, in uh, the three D uh, high res skills that you talk about, um, I think add a lot to meme culture as well. You know, using something like Rhino um, at, to make memes is is not only unconventional but also I think helps to um, position like to use architectural knowledge in a way that's productive for that space um, of memes. So uh, I think you know just some initial thoughts, but I think it's really um, a, a great project. Maybe I'll uh, jump in. Um, I just have a, I have a couple questions. So I'm interested in the ways in which you establish um, your rules, let's say, to construct your kind of lexicon. But I'm, I'm perhaps more interested in how this lexicon of memes generates the cultural information that's being carried by the meme, you know, so it's, it's what the, what it, what are the messages that are part of this? What is the cultural information that's being propagated right through the memes? Uh, and what are the key components of this information and who is your audience? Um, that's a very good question. So ever since the beginning of the thesis, uh, we were talking about the clash between discrete elements and the ones that were obvious. Um, so the thing is that like memes were kind of uh, created by my generation, by younger people who know how to use these and have enough literacy to actually understand the references. Um, so as of now, uh, I'm still within the realm of the memes and uh, I very much still expect this to be appropriated by people who are still uh, little like um, who who can still uh, read that stuff. Um, but I'm not necessarily saying, oh, this is only for the young audience. Like, um, as I said, like, this is a work in which I'm expecting other people's, anyone to come in and start to dispense their own content. And uh, the types of um, information that you're talking about, uh, I said, like, there's humor, there's satire, there's criticism, there's all these things happening at the same time. So um, I'm not necessarily putting a bracket on like what kind of information can enter at this point, as long as it's as long as it's respectful to everyone's existence. Um, but as of now, uh, it's more going into like these things that we take for granted in architecture, and posit as like the thing that we should always be um, looking at, and then operating towards, and like seeing if there's any other uh, entry points into this place, and like just look at the same thing in a different con in, in a different perspective and probably like generate new information information according to that. Um, so that's what I would be saying on that position. Can I say something, Zena? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alison. Oh, sorry. sorry. Mariana, you want to say something? You can go, you can go, I'll go after. Okay, sorry. Um, no, um, uh, I would like to ask you something about uh, your initial position. I found your presentation very engaging and uh, Matos has already uh, told many things that are were also in my mind regarding the way you represented uh, uh, the memes. But I, I'm particularly interested in your initial position because uh, your initial statement was uh, architect as a magical girl. And uh, I think this is uh, very interesting and engaging also from uh, my perspective because uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, I'm not talking about the feminist position in the ideologic way, but uh, it goes far beyond uh, the idea of uh, the fact that uh, architecture is not by architect, but is done 
today, if you can let me tell this, uh, mostly by white uh, male men, probably Western. Uh, so in a way, when you when you say as a magical girl, I think that this has the same dignity to be architect as anybody else in this uh, in this world. So as a, uh, as a paradox, I, I, so I was wondering if you have approached uh, uh, this uh, statement also from this perspective uh, uh, beyond the provocative uh, thing or not. And uh, to, to, before answering, the reason why I'm asking is because, uh, let's say, if you uh, try to discuss this from a biological perspective, I mean, this is the part of research that I'm doing currently, and especially evolutionary perspective. This is the main problem that we have when we talk about uh, the potential resilience of our built environment. The fact that uh, differently from other uh, selective process of nature, the processes in architecture involve a very limited number of people. And this uh, limitation of number of people is uh, according to these uh, comparative studies with evolutionary biology, one of the reason of our, uh, let's, let's say, environmental crisis. If we we we'll call it like this. And this always make me think about uh, when you present a project, uh, of course, this position can be discussed, uh, but uh, when you present a project, there is something that uh, is strongly linked to that position. And the fact that uh, the biologists, they talk about this uh, idea of diversity as a, an approach to increase resilience, they always, uh, they belong to a certain uh, stream of biology that has probably one of the most influential representative in the uh, I don't know if you ever heard about him, is Stephen Jay Gould. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, um, has become, let's say, particularly influential because he, let's say, invented or gave dignity to a certain approach, which is uh, the so-called acceptation. The reason why acceptation is interesting for me, and this is why I'm trying to understand if there is a connection between this position and the process that you use. The acceptation is exactly, for me, maybe I'm wrong, but it's very similar to the process that we have done. You have taken, I don't know, um, enlightenment, uh, uh, French, uh, I don't know, actually, I don't know, that, but let's say classical architecture, and then you have uh, 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 co-opted the uses and the function. This is exactly what is acceptation. So take that and, and, and uh, rebuild the pieces. And using this uh, methodology, Stephen Jay Gould demonstrate that uh, evolution uh, is more about uh, coping existing things rather than inventing new things, coping and transforming them in a different way. So to be pro probably it's too banal what I'm saying, but uh, this remind me the fact that uh, the you know this the, the example that Stephen Jay Gould does is uh, the uh, the feeders of the uh, birds. Actually, they were originally simple. Uh, uh, thermoregulation feature of uh, of uh, the, the, the the dinosaurs, so they were not invented to be. So what I'm trying to say is that in your project, uh, changing these things and changing the approaches, actually you open up a perspective that could be that uh, uh, different function, different perspective. Uh, uh, let's say I would say you open up uh, the possibility of a new way to interpret architecture beyond the classical way. So. To conclude, uh, not uh, architect as a magic set, but uh, uh, magic girl as magic girl, architect as whatever. I mean, something like this. So I, I wanted to ask you if you have a specific position uh, about this uh, this idea, or I'm just <laughs> completely off topic. <laughs> just to be I actually very much appreciate all the references that you're bringing, in, and I'm fascinated by the uh, like all the things that you posited. So. Um, I'm going to say, yes, I did have that specific position and I'm very happy that that actually came through. Um, so the thing with like magical girl is that uh, like, this is going to sound a bit cliche with like diversity and bringing in new voices. Um, but that's exactly where it is. Like if I'm going to enter this canon, uh, there has to be a way in which I'm going to enter as myself and not uh, the small group that you referring to like I can't filter myself through this word and then like come up with something that might actually invent something it's, it's it was still going to posit something that was exactly the same so um like the reason that I'm actually beginning two things is that first of all there's my position and like position of people who are like me and also like the communal aspect that goes into memes because meme making is very communal people talk to them talk to each other all the time there's like a mutual uh, trove of objects that people always go back and refer to and take their messages 
So like uh, it was me coming into this communal space, which is exactly what you're referring to, like this cyber space. And I'm like, I had this mantle of um, like my group, which is like magical group, entering this group and then uh, trying to um, enter the canon of architecture through those communal and uh, like a more diverse position. And I like going back to like Matt's thing, um, I'm gonna like kind of <laughs> own up to the fact that I have been able to produce something by coming through, through those two positions and entering into the canonical things uh, from a new entry point. So I, I don't know, like I really appreciate all the um, references that you posited. It's very interesting to hear all of that. Thank you. Um, I, for me, it was interesting to go through the project um, through some of the contradictions that I think exist in it. Um, I'll, I'll start with two. The first one uh, was um, the idea of the, um, the, the polysemy, the notion of rather than having a singular meaning, to produce multiple ones um, and the clear personal desire to have uh, con um, an aesthetic consistency throughout the project. Um, and I think then the notion of the multiplicity perhaps would warrant um, a further development of where that multiplicity is enacted in the project. And now I think it's enacted through the amount of objects that you present rather than the notion of varied voices or meanings. Um, from the use of color to the type of distortions or the type of um, uh, relationships that you have between objects, I think that actually uh, creates a lot of consistency and homogeneity, which is not necessarily something bad. But I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think those type of tensions can be made very productive in a project rather than trying to erase them. So this tension between the uh, singular and the multiplicity, I think deserves a little bit more um, effort in identifying how each one of those terms is applied to the project, because it can be perceived as both at the same time. Uh, and I think it's uh, the responsibility of the project to figure out um, in which ways both exist and are made productive. Uh, the second thing, for example, is an issue that is related to simply to 3D and 3D. Uh, the nature of the meme, the medium in which, which is communicated, and the um, and the you know the the, the image itself, uh, its flatness, in relationship to you making models. Or I think I don't know if you brought it up or Matt brought it up about I like three D the using Rhino, the environment in Rhino, um, which I would I, I would shift a little bit the the way the terminology is assigned to it more than architectural knowledge. In that sense, I think it's architectural skill or tool but it tends to produce a specific type of things. And those things have certain characteristics. And so for me, that's in a way, the argument could be that you're advancing meme, meme culture by cross-pollinating it with knowledge that comes from another discipline, therefore three-dimensionality, blah, 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 blah. You go down that rabbit hole. But on the other hand, I, I also want to see a version of the project where you accept that that is a limitation and that you need to operate within that limitation of the meme to, um, to say what you want to say. And if you allow yourself to do something else, then the meme doesn't apply as a framework anymore. So again, similar to the singular and the multiplicity, you're walking that line where you're taking your, uh, you're very liberally choosing which aspects of the meme you hold yourself to and which aspect of your, the meme you're allowing yourself to corrupt. And so I'm like, well, I don't know why. So I think in terms of its argument and framework, again, that's something that somehow you can conceptualize to make the thesis stronger. Um, and the last one that came to mind for me, I saw immediately a relationship to pop art and the way that common objects were appropriated and resituated. Uh, but then I thought, okay, let's talk about the column. And when you have this translation from the Greek column to the, I think it was a Greek column to banana, and then I think I'm less interested in column or banana, but more interested in banana column, because then it does produce something new. And if you think of the, of the banana beyond an image, you know, a banana cannot take tensile strength and it's mushy. So then you begin to operate again, like a mannerist, right? Where you wanna see the column, you wanna see the symbol of the column, 
but it has no structural um, role whatsoever in the project. So then I began to connect again pop art, a little bit of mannerism and a little bit of uh, postmodernism in the way that also the technique that you used was collage. You took this element, you replaced it with something else, that something else corrupted the meaning. And that, so there's a version of the project that is incredibly contemporary in the language and the aesthetics, but a version of it that is incredibly 20th century, right? And, or even before, right, 16th century and, and way back um, um, reusing classic elements. And um, for me, again, all of those tensions and contradictions can be either a weakness of the project or when um, built into an argument that begins to either transcend them you either are updating these courses that are very well established in the canon, which I think is something that seems to interest you, um, or you move somewhere else. And this is perhaps, so I'm trying to figure out if you were trying to do this type of innovation of absolute newness, which doesn't seem to me was the objective of the project, or the provocation is, is in, in filtering and very carefully and strategically connecting with these courses, references and tropes uh, that allow us to see again, familiar things in unfamiliar ways. So again, now I, I, I would love to see, I don't know, maybe some of the failed experiments of the project. I also thought it was interesting that you felt the need to spend quite a bit of time explaining your process, which in a thesis like this, I was like, well, you could have ne not necessarily shown us the uh, almost like the technique aspect of it, but go straight to the image and spend time there. So I don't know, once you take this thesis to your portfolio, um, maybe you can commit to um, to some ideas more so than others in the thesis, in the thesis perhaps to strengthen uh, some of the arguments. Thank you very much. Um, another part of the project too that might be interesting to push further if you continue it, <clears throat> which it seems like you should because you've already kind of established yourself as one of these like uh, new new people. Uh, and, and you caught the attention of all those other beam pages as well, which is not e easy. Um, whoever was in that Dankoid Wright group that found that meme, like must have really liked it because they shared it. Um, and I wonder A, if like you maybe, um, I mean, it's interesting that you have a, a single personality behind it. But that in a, some ways maybe could be holding you back a bit. Like maybe you need to add more people to your group to produce more stuff and, and infect it even more with different ideas because then you could, but you could still have your character, right? Like there's still a, a character and everyone has to play along with that character. But also I think it'd be interesting too to think about how these things get disseminated too because it's not always as easy as just sharing them. Uh, the uh, the afterlife of these images is like part, a big part of the, um, the, the game here. Um, the, when they get decontextualized and stolen and, and they end up in places where the meaning is completely lost. So you're actually dealing with like zero meaning in a way, which I think is maybe unfamiliar territory sometimes for us. Um, and it might be interesting to, to kind of think a little bit about how to um, creatively like put these out there that can then give them new meaning in different contexts. Um, there's some good articles about that from like 2013 in like the, the post internet era of decontextualizing things. And now, I mean, now it's problematic a little bit because all these like right wing uh, meme, meme accounts are like putting out this stuff that's kind of ironic, but when it, it or if they, the left wing people make it because it's ironic and then it becomes on a right wing page seriously. So it's kind of like another intellectual project of figuring out, you know, where these things land and how and being careful about, uh, about the meaning. So that, that would be another interesting area maybe to think about. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I, I thought that everything that you said was very interesting and um, I'm very happy that like there's a couple of things that keep coming up that were very much embedded in the thesis and um, I just don't have the time to explain every single one of them. One of them is like you bringing up Dinkard's decontextualization and uh, in my uh, research the thing that I really found out was that memes become like the communal thing that people always go back to 
as if they're just myths. Like people just don't know where they come from anymore, but everyone knows what they mean. And like initially they usually meant something completely different, but people went and appropriated. And also one of the things that you said, like I'm one person doing this entire thing. And like, this also goes back to uh, Mariana's um, position where she was saying, you have to accept your, your limitations. And I actually did do that. And my way of like expanding the life of the, this thesis was, was to go and say, here's my assets, please go and appropriate them. But I think it's very interesting that you say you should instead bring in more people as creators to like actively create these things. That was um, honestly not, not something that uh, I first of all came up with and wasn't able to do it because until today, this was still my thesis project. Um, but I am going to take up on that position and thank you very much for that feedback. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick clarification. I didn't say accept your limitations. I think you can force yourself to um, produce, you know, singularity or multiplicity, understanding what, what is productive in the context of what you're doing, uh, right? So just again, productive contradictions and tension. You know, I wanted, I wanted to ask the question uh, um, whether or not you were, you did research on what makes a meme propagate, right? Because, um, or why would it spread? You know, because memes, you know, within the context of how they were developed uh, or the idea developed through Dawkins was the notion that they can become extinct, right? If they don't replicate and there have to be things that actually determine why or how a meme would replicate itself or propagate, you know, within a culture. Uh, and I think, and that comes back, that comes back to this question, both of audience and language, because I was asking myself, uh, as you were presenting about the degree of complexity and specificity within each of the memes that you produce, you know, it's one thing when it becomes this uh, entire, um, let's say work, as opposed to just the single identifiable moment, right, of the column becoming the banana. You know, I thought that was a really interesting one because I, I kept thinking about the kind of layers and complexity of a single meme that you were developing and wondering if it would not propagate more so if it was actually stripped down, you know, to a more essential core, right, so that it's not the complexity of how the whole language gets used, right, but it's individual elements that start to undo a certain idea of architecture, you know, or architectural culture uh, through the, the language itself. Because I think that's always for me um, an issue is the, is the complexity, you know? Uh, and I, in bringing it back to language, it's the idea of, you know, thinking a single word, like that what you're producing, right? Uh, that would propagate more quickly uh, by that single act rather than all the layers that you might add to it. Um, and, and that can be another level, right, of how, uh, how an audience repropagates those memes through, their, um, through being embedded in another kind of cultural context that, that gets set up. Hi, Avgu. Um, I'd love to jump in and ask a question about your work as it jumps, let's say, out of the meme landscape and into the urban fabric and whether or not that's even possible. And I'm asking this in, in part because uh, someone like Jean-Jacques Lequeux, whom you're looking at, uh, a lot of the work um, that he put forward wasn't built, but not because he didn't want it to be built. It would have been something that I think, um, I, I don't know, just kind of reading a little bit on his work and his exhibition, the exhibition of his drawings last, um, last year in New York um, was pretty amazing. So it's kind of amazing to see an architect who works through a series of references, just as you're doing, um, whose work actually doesn't get built, but gets in a way included in, um, uh, in, in kind of in, in the numerous publications and he works for, um, my understanding is that he works at a municipal level to actually be a kind of city representative of certain kind of uh, technical drawings. So in a way there's a kind of technical site to look at and then there is the kind of 
um, imaginary side. Um, but the, the fact stays that I think his work uh, was meant to be built. And I'm curious about your work and whether or not um, uh, you would imagine these things in the city and how they might then affect the audience and the reading of the buildings as they get kind of developed uh, within that kind of landscape. Um, this was actually something that came up throughout my uh, thesis, like, is, are they going to stay uh, on the digital space or am I going to uh, actually imagine them as like urban things that have freedom of nationality, which we start to see from all angles. Um, so I took the position that uh, I am not going to imagine them as like urban objects and I have like a very specific other thing in which I'm going to say um, I'm making these things so that I can posit polysemy and multiple um, entry points into the things that uh, I think we take for granted as architects. Um, so that's one thing about the urban fabric. And the other way that it's like very <laughs> interesting that you bring up the fact that the Curie was a dressman. Um, and uh, also one of our discussions was that like the precedent culture that we had, um, I am looking at like the visionary architects and stuff, but uh, before uh, like digital, digital uh, composition became something, it was more that uh, people trace over a plan, like memorize and entire thing, and then went on and drew their own thing that like kind of drew from that. And now uh, the digital, digital composition is looking at an image, identifying images and then 3D, like building them in uh, three dimensional formats. Um, so how that changes the context uh, of the meme shines if they're put into the urban thing, I am operating on like a technical level as like, like I was, even though like technology puts us in completely different places. Um, but about the urban thing, if these things were like put in the urban fabric, um, I would love to see them not as like a cluster, but maybe as like individual things uh, spread throughout the city because they need this canvas or, of norm or like normal things for them to uh, create that clash where you just see everything normal and then all of a sudden this thing pops up and you just like have to uh, like encounter that rupture of consciousness and that actually puts you into the space of thinking of what's happening, um, even though like digitally these things have a strength as when uh, they're in numbers. I think that that changes in nature when you put them into urban fabric in which like you need them to be kind of standalone pieces because if they're all together then they set an environment where they are the normal but then uh, like the language of this thing is, is that these are not supposed to be normal things. They're supposed to be things that you encounter with and then it unsettles you and then propels you into new territory for thinking. Um, so yeah, that's what I Okay, I think the, the, we have five more minutes. I just want to make sure um, everybody has any last uh, comments or statements they want to share. Okay, well, we can... It is I curious. Um, I mean, I, maybe just a second because we have a yes. couple of minutes. I think, Avgo, it is curious that, you know, you kind of come back to the conclusion that in order to understand the pathologies when we have to have the kind of normality of the background. And uh, maybe this is something that Alessandro was kind of alluding to in the, the kind of uh, paleontological work, but you know, um, I think the conclusion that you reach is that you actually kind of rely on this classical landscape to allow yourself to have a voice of difference. And that, that to me, um, that to me sounds um, like you're operating within a system that already is established and you need it to continue to remain the same. That in, in a sense that kind of what we call, let's say the, the, the context, the landscape, the canon, um, your work actually almost requires it to continue to operate in a, in a quite a traditional way. Um, I would say to that, um, I would require it to be there once I uh, need like my objects to function as like these new things which provide, provide new entry points into like the things that we're thinking about. But I don't think that I would need them after that because the thing is that if the background is going to stay the same, then the foreground is going to stay the same. And like I, I've been always like making this position in which I am really working towards making these things viable, in which they go infect and change the DNA of other things. And for that to happen, um, like the meme objects also have to like start evolving themselves so that they, they like manner of infection isn't always the same. Um, so um, like 
if the background has to stay the same, maybe only the moment in which I'm looking at them and then entering them in a different point. Um, but as of now, like my thesis is not at a point where it has gone beyond that, like, which is why I'm saying my thesis is going to emanate after I'm done. Uh, I'm still going to go back and work on this. But like, I, I very much agree that like, uh, if I rely on that background, like the foreground, or like the things I'm going to be doing, or like the modes that I'm always going to be operating is going to stay the same, which is not the point of memes. Like they should be evolving and moving quite past themselves and then like bringing about their own ends so that they can bring in new inventions. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. So uh, I just want to thank you. It's always hard to, to start to be the first student, especially in the morning. Um, so I think that was brave. Um, and I will say that when I was asked to, to advise you of glue, I didn't know you. I also didn't know a single thing about memes. For whatever reason, I, I was oblivious <laughs> about the humor, the culture. Um, I like to say I can be funny, but for whatever reason, I just couldn't uh, engage and I, I feel like I've learned a lot actually um, more so maybe than the reverse I've learned a lot about that culture and um, have learned to see it more uh, despite the fact that I am um, extremely uh, familiar with images and there's disseminations I for whatever reason the dissemination of memes and that kind of like niche culture escaped me uh, maybe because I'm an outsider I'm not sure but um, but I will say that I think there's been some really interesting uh, discoveries. I think first, um, one of the first things that I usually tell my thesis students is it's very difficult to translate a cultural topic into an architectural thesis. Um, and I think to some extent you've took on that challenge um, and you, and maybe to, to follow Anna's point, like maybe you had to remain in a kind of relatively conservative uh, maybe déjà vu architectural terrain to be able to take this on as a cultural thesis. Uh, I'm sorry, as an architectural thesis. Um, so I think it's been interesting to see your passion about this topic, despite how different it is than how I work or, or even think about memes. Um, and to, to some extent, that's what you want in a, th in a graduate thesis, right? You want to something you're passionate about. You want to learn about a kind of methodology for working in the future and you want to end with something that can keep growing and 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 changing and morphing um, into your, hopefully your own work. So I feel like you've ended at a very good point uh, uh, this summer and despite the challenges um, of our time. So thank you Ovgu and congratulations. Uh, we're gonna move on to Andrew Zago's student, Fatime. Are you here? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, the floor is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Fatima. I am from the MR1 program. My thesis project is interested in making a particular architectural expression to be a vehicle for creating a social urban space. It attempts to have a deep connection to the social life and culture of a historical city and translated to a new architectural typology that does not exist in the city. First of all, I wanna invite all of you to visit my city, Esfahan. Here is my city, Esfahan. A city in the middle of Iran, in you know, um, of course, Iran. And, <laughs> It, this city is, uh, um, the river, there is a river that split this city in two parts, north and south. It's almost historical and old city and south side of the city is more contemporary and modern. This city is uh, famous in the world because of its historical architecture. And of course, because of uh, public spaces that's largely shaped by this guy in Safavid dynasty. The first type of, uh, there are two different type of um, public space in the city. First is squares. That is, the, the, this one is Atir Square, which is this square in this city with thousand years history that is quite rectangular and is connect to the newer square that is 500 years old and is the one of the most important places in this city. 
the starting of this quiz shows that how people use the non-program part of these square every day for every weekend, special occasions, ceremonies, more than program part of the squares. Another type of public space in this city is bridge. The river is uh, crossed by five points of bridge from the Safavid dynasty, that three of them less important, not architecturally, they don't have a program, but two of them are more important because of a specific and uh, special spaces that they have. First one is Haju Bridge. It's a special bridge because it has two floors. First floor that is under the road. Uh, it has multiple space that are all connected together and create a platform for people that meet and chat, have fun. And this, the, um, and this Upper, upper level, um, level is uh, bounded by wall and arches and opening and create a uh, um, platform and opportunity for people to go through these spaces. This is a typology diagram for this whole, um, bridge and typology for this one that shows how people use the, sec the first floor more than the um, upper level. I know that people every day use these small spaces under the bridge for protesting, for having fun, singing, dancing, playing music. This is another bridge, which is the longest bridge uh, on the river. The same quality, same room uh, on first floor and same opening and rooms for top floor. This is a diagram for this typology and shows how people are gathered in a small spaces that have in this bridge. 2020, now I am here at the end point of the old part of the city and at the beginning of part of the uh, contemporary part of the city. I am next to the longest bridge that is the most important part of the city next to hotels, shopping centers, busiest part of the city that always full of people, tourists, visitors. For this third type, for this uh, thesis, I developed it to these two typology and proposed another typology for public space. I combine a square type and bridge type and uh, arranged it in elevation, is tacked it in front of a government office. In fact, my project is, uh, consists of two parts. One public space that is um, in front of a Ministry of Cultural Heritage and Activity that has a screen of Bruce Which This is a diagram of uh, um, urban section diagram of how the project acts to the other type of public space. And here is the project in this context. For designing the project on all small spaces, uh, these uh, thesis explores the, uh, mm, the quality of uh, um, potential of uh, combining a small individual spaces that they are similar in character and arrange them in elevation for creating a new super component. Uh, it, and through this, uh, the project sees a relationship amongst individual users, the aggregation of spaces and the connection of spaces and the connection to the urban space. These are two drawings that are arranged based on a historical plan. They are, these two are the same shape, but the old spaces are different. And this is the study of each space uh, through the light and through the days. This is a study model of um, each spaces and a screen that are Sim, uh, uh, simpler and a smaller shape. And here it is. 
what does it look like in this context? It creates a mask, mask uh, uh, on top of um, government office and create a mysterious places in front of this office. This is a back, this is a north side of project. This is a public place that people can go there and go through this spaces. This is a back side is related to the office, government office, is a, uh, a screen of Bruxelles that is simpler part of these screens. This is the details of each spaces and how people are in these place in this smallest place. All of this play, uh, all of these components and a small individual are connected based on how they um, we see in a bridge. They are all connected with a stairs and going up through the 20th, 20th floors. It has the office has 25 floors that are at 20 more floors in front of it. And the section that shows activities and um, uh, activities and spaces that have pushed it in one side of the project. The ground floor, which has looked like a, a, a courtyard, create opportunity for people to gather. And the place that a journey starts, each floor that connect with the stairs, and the last floor. These are opportunity for people. This diagram shows how um, people can go up with different um, ways. And how it look like. It has more opportunity. And if this is the um, circulation diagram for office building. The interior creates a deep, actually, the project creating deep interior that is still feels exterior, as well as a public space that feels private. These are the strangers of interior and how it looks like from the office. These are old experiments of uh, my experiment, photo collage of old and historical photos and a project. And this is my final model and that shows how all spaces are connected. Can you stop sharing? Yes, sure. And then hold it up again? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I can spotlight your video, Fatima, just a second. Can you put it back? Yeah. And I think this should work. Yes. Yeah, how it look like? I will share my mirror screen that you can see the whole project there. And can I share my screen at mirror board? And this is how I'm project. Thank you. Maybe stop sharing for the discussion. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll, thank you, uh, Fatima. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We can hear. All right. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. And it's actually, uh, yeah, I, I, I never been to Isfahan, but it's one of the places that certainly is in my, in my, in my route. Um, and I, I take it you are, you are from Isfahan? Yes. So, um, I mean, I, I, I like the presentation. I really enjoyed the fact that you sort of took us on a, on a kind of journey and introduced the site and introduced the, uh, you know, the sort of gigantic plaza and the bridges and the specifics of it. And, and, uh, and you know, for all the maybe 
cliche one could kind of imagine about the architect sort of looking at the side and 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 being enamored and doing a sort of analysis. We lost you, um, your voice. Um, and to to actually to consider and to engage on that on that kind of practice. Um, I was wondering. I mean, maybe maybe I, I sort of missed the the beginning. You know, before to getting into the kind of into the into the sort of building or thesis discussion, I wonder if you could kind of restate uh, maybe in like in a, in a sentence or two um, the specifics of or like what your thesis ambition is. You know, as opposed to the the specifics of the project and the site, which again I really like and I like to you know and I like to have a sort of deeper discussion. But but just to maybe put it on a kind of more like uh, general context. And um, if you could say something that will basically bring the project uh, beyond the specificity of the site and the specificity of your understanding and personal maybe relationship with the site, you know, which I think is definitely important. So I, the project is, um, the project actually is a, uh, public space, which is uh, based on a square and bridge. The small spaces into the bridge, there are um, a lot of spaces in the bridge and it's stacked all of them on top of each other and placed in front of a government office. The government office, because um, government is always in, is always been there and uh, in this city, uh, I wanted to propose that is a connection between people and governments, and also the um, how people can see the government office. This is the part that I wanted to have people next to government because the, the only there is a curtain wall between people and government that they don't have any connection, but the people can see for first time they can see government office is the first, the first. What the, the whole project is, the government office is an office, but the public space is a small individual covered space based on the bridge that all connected for people that have um, activities like singing, exactly the same part in the bridge. They, they sing there they, all the time, every day. I know because I'm from there. They don't use bridge for passing the river. They just use bridge for just meeting each other, to, to singing, dancing, playing music, or activities that are not able to do maybe in a square. So the covered uh, spaces create opportunity for them, for people, especially for young people, to have this activity. Also, it creates opportunity for people that from Isfahan. Isfahan is a flat city, it's a historical flat. There isn't any uh, tower in the, in this city. So it creates opportunity for people to have a view, wide view of a city, especially in the south, in the old side, that uh, is, it can be great opportunity for them. I try to connect all, all spaces with the stairs to, be a, like a climbing a mountain and it'd be a journey for them. Right, thank you. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I, thanks for the explanation. So, I mean, uh, so I will, I will just maybe put a, a few, a few comments on. First, I, I really like the way, uh, again, as you kind of move from sort of more analytical diagrams to sort of projective, the way you begin to cluster these pieces that seem to sort of take on on uh, pieces and parts of the site, but then they begin to produce something other than that. I mean, it reminds me of Corbusier Benny's Hospital, and I wasn't sure whether you were doing a plan or a section. I quickly understood that. I, I think it produces a super interesting mass, you know, which sort of flickers between a, a sort of big rectangular chunky square and something that begins to have silhouette but without being too 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 giving too much about that that, that possibility of a silhouette and then you move into the sort of grain uh, of the of the you know what seems sort of structure but it's sort of pattern making uh, again back to some of the sort of islamic architecture maybe of the site um i i like all that I, and and uh, 
I like it more as a kind of diagram as an overall, uh, when it gets sort of closer and those things turn into potential sort of diagree structure, I'm less interested, but again, this is maybe more my, my, my sort of personal uh, take on it. Um, the, the comment that I would say is that on the one hand, as, a, kind of, as an architect, I think it's kind of an amazing idea to sort of bring something vertical, like a, you know, it's a landmark, a monument, an icon, undeniably in a city that is horizontal, uh, probably full of monuments. Many of the, many, many, many of the Mukarna that I've been kind of interested in, like, you know, the past decade were actually located in Isfahan. And so it, it, you know, and I completely buy the idea of even of seeing this thing in what it seems like a, a post or, or, or little, or little uh, vignettes of how your building appears in that context. Uh, being critical, it also kind of plays a little bit on the sort of maybe typical kind of megalomaniac or grandiloquent architect trying to just put something in the landscape which is going to set itself apart uh, from the context. And, and, and again, I obviously am an architect as well, so I know, and we all kind of uh, have those tendencies. But I'm also kind of more maybe wary where of the of the tendencies or the political systems and, and context that might support those possibilities in order to produce uh, yet another kind of single monument, let's say, where it would be the only tower that kind of dominates the landscape and maybe the meaning of that, you know, in a in a in a particular context, you know, the political context of you know of Iran and so on. And um, I mean, I, I'm just kind of curious, and, and I think it's an interesting, you know, architecture is not devoid of, of the sort of you know, political complexes, you know, and the polemic that brings at it. So, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a great, uh, I, I think it's a great thesis and a great project to sort of engage that, you know. So, if I may push just a little bit more, I think. Um... I was thinking something along the lines of what Marcelo um, was, I think, getting at when he asked you the question of the thesis, because I think you described the project very thoroughly, and there's many things that I also like about it, but I don't think you necessarily articulated the thesis of the project. And um, I have never been to Iran, and in understanding it through your description of it, I thought, well, you have this plaza that probably when it was made, it was the biggest thing in town. And then you have the access that emerged from the larger urban organization. And probably when it was made, it was the biggest thing in town. And then you have the bridges and probably when that was made, it was the biggest thing in town. And then you come up with this tower and now it's the new big thing in town. And so I, I find that, in, that, that sequence uh, that carries um, the notion of publicness through a historical timeline and uh, what shape it takes on now and the fact that it's a tower and that is indeed, it's like, you know, by far the biggest thing in town, right? This is like you worked at, a, at, at an exponentially, like the scale of magnitude through which you used, you made it this, a very specific decision about scale uh, that in a sense, I think it happened, if I understood correctly, you took exactly the plan of the plus and the bridge and overlay them and at the scale that they exist horizontally, you turn them vertically or you change the size of it? Uh, the plan that I, that I collaged, the part of it is uh, from one historical mosque that I rearranged it in my shape and my arrangement and used it in vertical, arranged it in vertical. Connection between spaces is based on what happened in bridge. Is exactly- But did you, change, did you change the size? the original size of your precedence. Yes. Mm. So I'm, I'm trying to find um, the, what, were, what was the criteria for establishing the systems of translation to go beyond a certain drawing that you were clearly attracted to, uh, such that you turn something that is occupied in a certain well, in a certain way as a type of commons, right? The type of public space. And then in rearranging it, it becomes another kind of commons because verticality offers some new possibilities. And I'm sure it also embraces some of the one that exists in the original form of the plaza. And again, I think all of those operations beyond their um, aesthetic appearance, their organizational offering, um, they can be somehow 
um, also uh, theorized or, or conceptualized in the context of the thesis. And for me, the connecting thread is the notion of public space, whether this happens in an outdoor plaza, whether if it happens in a piece of infrastructure, whether it happens in what we would more normally understand as a building. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think in that sense, this idea of the new commons or the new public or a type of public that is um, l fully loaded with your own knowledge of the political situation, the relationship of the public with the government, et cetera, and reaches the project. But I would like, again, I would, I would like to hear from you in the construction of a thesis beyond the physical description of the architectural object, how this idea of new publics, of new commons, of public space becomes the stage for a new type of engagement between, um, you know, again, the public and um, whatever figures of art authority, because I think architecture um, has such a long history, uh, particularly in this in this topic of um, uh, figures of authority, the type of architecture they produce, and how the stage, how they become the stage for a type of political platform, uh, and at the same time, how they condition the relationship between uh, public and authority. So again, I think there's a very strong thesis there. And somehow you focused all of your time in describing the object, which I think it's great for many reasons. And Marcelo started talking about them. I am super intrigued by this, uh, um, moving away from the idea that a tower is a model of stacking. And I have obviously questions about course and circulation. I don't know if that is of interest to you and if that was a central part of the conversation between you and Andrew, but I can see so many architectural opportunity from typology to organization to, envelopes, so, you know, structures, so on and so forth. But still, I think, again, it would be useful to figure out how those elements are actually supporting larger ideas that are uh, driving the thesis. Very kind of small comment. I love that the mirror board was called the Zago cult. I would have loved to hear more about that because, you know, I've been to a lot of Andrews. Uh, I'm supposed to use that one for the presentation. That's our secret. <laughs> No, I, I loved it. And, but actually beyond the, the joke um, or the funny aspect of it is that, you know, the attention that Andrew uh, makes students put into the details of the building from the tectonic to the aesthetic, to the structural, to the organizational, but all of that folded into some contemporary notion that allows us to think about buildings in a fundamentally different way than the references that you used to produce it. I think for me that is so rich that I, you know, I can tell you're very excited about your project. I just want you to load it with more of uh, of that and um, and and yeah, and enrich it as well. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sanford. <laughs> speaking to me. Hey, you, Isla. First of all, I want to say hello to all the friends I haven't seen in years and years. <laughs> And of course, Ovgu, I didn't it's say anything, you. but it's wonderful to see you again, Andrew, the whole gang. Yeah, listen, we'll, we'll pick up some time for that. Um, look, I don't know, I have to you know, enter somewhere here. I don't know how obvious it is, too obvious to state or strangely absent, and that is the degree to which this project engages, and in some ways you could say even responds to Heatherwork's awful, disgusting, absolutely unacceptable vessel in New York City in the Hudson Yards as a kind of piece of public or even experiential uh, sculpture or, you know, uh, so I assume everybody knows it. Um, there were real strong differences. And, but one thing that's important, I think, uh, to acknowledge is that these types of projects, including the one I think we're looking at here, whether it's explicit or even aware uh, to the designer uh, or not, the creator is that the, uh, the urban, the understanding of what it is when one does an urban intervention in, or the urban uh, um, object that is being addressed is very much a state of mind. And in that sense, the, tr the inclusion, let's say, or the production of a, of a place where states of mind can be new ones introduced or new ones discovered, uh, a completely different kind of uh, feeling, shall we say, 
that one can now have in a classical city. Um, I think it's an important one because I think most of the radicality of how we will continue now to think uh, and integrate all of the new, shall we say, permissions that, uh, that have been introduced into our culture, not only in the last six months, but in the last several years, is, a, is, a, is an important one. At the same time, you know, I'm not going to easily or anytime soon get over uh, the experience of uh, watching a meme project, the one that preceded this one, uh, get presented to us. Uh, and continually feeling that we are really failing to address uh, anything significant about that phenomenon. Let's leave it at that. And what I want to say is that in terms of methodology, and I really throw this out to the rest of you all, is the degree to which we've become so tolerant now in architecture. Oh, let me say it another way. And this may or may not be true, but it, it occurs to me when, I when I'm in what I'm listening to is that somewhere between the classicisms and even the modernist classicisms, there was a period, a very intense period of anti-classical work. And it moved us very strongly away, even from classical modernist uh, tendencies and principles. So much of the work that I find so bewildering today and fascinating is the fact that you could say that it operates in a complete oblivion, not meaning completely emancipated from the classical methods and models, but also in complete oblivion from the efforts, the energies, and shall we say, even the evolutionary successes that brought us there. In that sense, it seems that from a sort of rhetorical perspective, and when I say rhetorical, I mean the types of operations that are now uh, developed and deployed in order to make meaning, I'm referring to both of the projects so now, and it's also true that in a certain sense, something I noticed when teaching at SciArc last year, and the last couple of years, was the tacit but incompletely yet theorized interest in both meanings and states of mind, um, and how in fact those constitute perhaps the emergence of a new kind of a, a regime neither good nor bad, at least that we know of right now. But what I want to say is the tolerance of random processes in our methodology, serendipitous, miscellaneous, arbitrary things, which uh, even, for example, the beginning of the assembly using collage and just sort of whacking it all together to see what happens. You know, uh, again, what, I, what that is, is a kind of a permission, not necessarily earned, but nonetheless, it's a permission that historically we have a right to address, but I would say probably only if it contains a kind of, um, uh, if it contains a certain awareness, a certain vigilance or acknowledgement, if you like, of the efforts, especially what I would call the anti-classical efforts that got us there. Meaning I don't think it can be completely detached from them, otherwise, it devolves into miscellaneity or, and often even sometimes silliness, which for me is the only way I can really understand why memes are, are important to so many people because I, otherwise I have no access to them at all. And I want you to know that I've tried and I continue to try. I now acknowledge that they're more important than simply being dismissible, but their complete lack of ability to explain to us the criteria of their intelligibility and their operations is something I find very troubling. But you could also say that about architecture. So I wanted to sort of say to that, and that is to say that two of the things that, one thing that I love very much about your project was the slide, the moment, and the comment, because it was so completely convincing and integrated when you showed us the space that you said was simultaneously indoors and outdoors. Um, for me, that really, it was a very powerful image because there was nothing missing from being completely persuasive at the moment when I saw it. But I also found fascinating when you showed us the pathway diagram. Now, I think pathways are critically important. They've been since the time of the surrealists, and they're, being, they're important again today. One of the things that is so really despicable, I think, about the Heatherwick project is the, on one level, is the 
controlled pathway, if you like, is, is its inability to be like a forest, like a random walk, or to offer one that kind of a random walk, which yours certainly did. But I would say that then you showed us the very strict um, images of, for example, a classical a high risers with the uh, with the stacks of elevators. Now, with that kind of channeled uh, motion, channeled movement, predetermined motion, you do have opportunities for social experience, for the state of mind that is communal, communitarian, and uh, you know, like uh, Mariana. Mariana used the term, you know, commons, and I think that you know everything today strikes me a boomer as being significant. And why don't we just, I always think, why don't we stop here? Why don't we think this through? Anyway, I just want to throw that out to my whole gang. Uh, all generations, that's it. I, sorry, just one follow up uh, to that, Sanford, the anti-classical. Can you give us a couple of examples of work? Oh, uh, well, first of all, anti-classical is the, the standard one, of course, let's just say the, the emancipations that happened in a way many times throughout with the modernist, let's say, attempts to free ourselves, for example, from the orders. But then, of course, modernism reproduced those orders in a certain way by freeing themselves from, you know, the ornamental and the veterinary idea. But when I say the anti-classical, I'm talking really about the movements that started with the with the with the break from uh, modernist uh, rigidities, uh, shall we say, rec rectilinearities, uh, symmetries, uh, and so on and so forth. In other words, um, you know, I would say, and you're certainly part of it, my friend, is the introduction, for example, in your work, let's say, or let's just say in the universe that your work made possible uh, of, uh, of indeterminate events that become structuring events, uh, and so on and so forth. In a certain sense, is, you know, somebody brought that comment up earlier, I think it was uh, Anna, uh, about, and I disagreed with it, but it was beautiful nonetheless. And it was the idea that there was perhaps a, a, a residual conservatism by relying on the existence of a background to produce the differential that made the gesture in the foreground actually take on power and meaning. Um, and I would say without that, you don't have any criteria whatever, uh, nor do you have an orientation nor do you really have the possibility of generating meaning. For example, if I just want to speak in tongues, you have no way of referencing it. In a certain sense, these are social contracts and there has to be those types of structures. And I think that every architecture in a certain way today, because precisely they've, 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 they've laid to ruin, if you like, so many of the, uh, let's say, untenable uh, armatures uh, that subtended the classical system, you still must make every gesture. You see, a language still has, to, language use, a sentence still has to um, acknowledge the shared context uh, that both the receiver, the users, etc., cetera, um, are using in order to make use of it. That's it. I didn't mean to lecture. I didn't mean to lecture. It's kind of like I'm uh, still dealing with this meme thing. It's killing me. Thank you. At the, at the hazard of following you, Sanford, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I first, I just wanted to say, I really, I really appreciate the project. Um, I appreciate a lot uh, of the things that you've done in this. And I think one of the, you know, one of the questions that's coming out of this is the um, first, let's say simplistically, the idea of urban public space being restricted to occupying the horizontal and, and questioning this and what happens when you, uh, when you pull that into the vertical, just as a first uh, simple uh, question. And because I'm asking about the role of public space in the city and what happens when this is pushed into a vertical envelope. And for me, the edge condition is a very interesting one uh, because it's a folding up, right, of the carpet of the city into a vertical surface, but that vertical surface is still opened up onto the city, uh, but in an entirely new way. And and you didn't address that, like what the implications were of that move, which I think is so critical, right? Uh, but I think that's a key piece. I I love the you know the patterning, let's say, of the surface, even though I don't necessarily know 
where the specific logics uh, come from. I know where um, in a kind of generic way, I understand it because it goes back, let's say, to the history of how those, how many of the um, conditions that produce the urban space, let, let's say within, uh, within the city itself already exists as a local aggregation, right? That happens over time uh, as opposed to a kind of global imposition of a, of a larger logic. And that getting played onto the surface in some ways as a, as a reference back to the population itself that's occupying it, I think is important. Even though the interesting thing was that the, the, uh, the precedents that you started with were very, very different, right? In the sense of being large collective vessels, you know, for the public. The huge, you know, urban square, for example, or even the bridge as being an occupied space. And so I think the change that occurs as soon as you compress, you fold it up into the vertical, how you address that condition, what happens when you compress it, and when you change, let's say, that, that massive collection of, um, of bodies within a space from the urban plane, what happens when they start becoming local? I mean, I love the ant farm, you know, slice through the ant farm and the paths that might move through it. But I think you have to address, you know, all of those conditions, because for me, that's the interest that I have in the thesis itself and what you've, uh, what you've produced. Um, you know, the transcoding of information offers invention in the space of the city. And I think that's, uh, and, and I think there is a lot of invention. And of course, um, there are precedents for this. You know, I mean, the obvious one for me was uh, MVRDV's Mirador project, right? Which basically took a block of the city, flipped it uh, vertically, and then asked the question about how we understand neighborhood you know, within that new context. But the interesting thing about that project was that um, that it was housing, right? So the, the kind of local articulation of elements now thought vertically offered a new way of thinking about that kind of condition and offered us a new idea of housing uh, being vertical. And you're not, you're operating with a public space. So I think you have to address that question as well, like what happens there. I think the other thing that was interesting, let's say about the Mirador project was the big hole in the middle, right? Because the big hole in the middle was, became the new public space because that was the courtyard now uh, that was produced. So um, I was asking myself about uh, two things that I thought were, were less resolved in your project. One was the spaces between the vertical surface uh, the, the kind of pattern surface and the opposite, your bureaucratic uh, side, right? Uh, Highland stride side. That rather than, and I didn't really understand how that space between work, but I could imagine that those become larger spaces of connection that have to become highly choreographed and that they don't run all the way through, but only at specific points. And I think the other place that was less clear to me was how how this reaches the ground, right? Because how you actually funnel people in, uh, you know, how it becomes uh, public is has to do with that turn, right? That single moment, uh, and that to me was also a kind of larger question. But I, I do very much appreciate uh, the kind of thinking behind it, but I also appreciate what you produced. You know, I, I think that, you know, there's often a lot of intentionality behind what we do. And then there's also discoveries that happen uh, through processes that lead to things that, that might get interpreted or decoded after the fact, almost as a point of critique, e even when you're doing it with your own work. But, uh, but a really interesting, uh, interesting project. Thank you. I agree. Just to jump in for a moment, Fatima, it's great to see you today. Beautiful presentation. And also, I completely agree with Ayla. I think that you've really invented a kind of new vis visual or a new typo typology for that public facade. And uh, the way I understood the project is that um, you could uh, 
maybe project this tower into the city, but you could also say that if a tower were built by a kind of private entity, this public space makes it possible. And so somehow its size then gets somehow, um, you know, maybe counterbalanced by the fact that it's full of the general public. And so in my mind, it's something uh, between the Seagram Tower where the public space in the front produces a plaza and maybe some of the things that Isla was talking about uh, or the Central Pompidou facade where the entire kind of network of pipes becomes um, kind of populated by, by a bunch of young people. I, I think that there's something incredible about uh, that addition of a kind of typological and programmed facade rather than simply brisole that are somehow environmental only and not really populated by, by, by people. So I really think it's beautiful and I wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. A great five minutes. And listen, uh, just, I know you, you said it, it, it was maybe the part not as clear. So there is a, basically that that government offices are opaque and no one knows what goes on. And so that's the, ba it's a, it's a fairly straightforward slab building, but then it turns into a kind of a zoo or aquarium. People can crawl up and down there and just stick their face in and see what, what people are doing. And, and the only connection really is you could go to was that restaurant on the top where the two connect. But otherwise, you know, I know you stuck by that, the idea that there's a kind of um, membrane separating the two and it's transparent. And so I think, you know, in the end that becomes, uh, you know, I think the politics of the project. Thank you, yeah. Can I add something? Okay, can you hear me? Please. Okay. Um, I want to put a couple of notes. No, I, I like the project uh, a lot, very much, uh, very well done. Uh, well, probably one of the uh, limitation of the project for me is that uh, probably because I like so much the concept, I would have liked to see more, more uh, images, how the people engage with these opportunities that to create great opportunities. Uh, the, the, the main thing, as I agree with Ila, the, the fact that you have, uh, are creating a vertical uh, public space is uh, uh, definitely um, a positive aspect of the project, uh, uh, exactly because of the climatic condition. We were discussing before about the, the New York uh, thing, and yeah, this is exactly what we can see here the difference. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it's exactly a place where probably also in the past, if they would have the possibility to build a vertical space, they would have done in that sense. Uh, all the climatic condition of Iran, I, I expect that this, in, as for what I've seen for the building, uh, it makes sense uh, to reduce the base, uh, to increase the shadow and to have a height that, uh, uh, I can say, in, in a way, uh, maximize the possibility to have uh, uh, outdoor comfort uh, in that level. So I think it's uh, it's very interesting. The second aspect, uh, and again, since that probably you will think that I'm obsessed, which is probably true, I think that part of this is more interesting for me is the same one uh, as we have discussed in the other project, the fact that you are approaching the project from a really, as I, I was saying before, an exaptative perspective. So non-functional in the sense that you don't create a shape with a function, but you do the opposite. You make a proliferation of shapes that comes from existing and agree with uh, uh, with Sanford when he said that uh, this, the fact that uh, uh, you are not inventing from scratch, but you're using some kind of uh, lexicon uh, makes the project more closer to this idea of uh, acceptation of, uh, how can I say, economy of uh, uh, proliferation of shape with a certain level of structure, nevertheless uh, interpreting them in a completely different way. In fact, I don't know if, if you allow me again <laughs> to tell about my obsession. I always like the fact that uh, when Gould, the guy who was mentioned before, is, is trying to explain how acceptation works, he's using architecture. Surprisingly, in architecture, we don't consider this. And surprisingly, he's used a very specific kind of architecture, which is the Byzantine architecture in general, in particular, the one of, uh, of uh, uh, San Marco in Venice. And he's explained how every shape of that chair, every uh, element of that uh, uh, church, it comes from a, a proliferation of shapes that then have been uh, uh, co-opted functionally from something else. And I think that uh, what you showed us is a perfect uh, example of how these uh, can happen. So a certain level of, uh, I would say, economy 
of uh, economy done through associative thinking of using existing elements, but to recomposing them with a completely different uh, purpose. And what I like is that this different purpose is exactly, as I said before, in exaptation is a non-purpose, is not is a non-program. And uh, when I was studying the, the exaptive uh, phenomenon of architecture, I, I have been working a lot in a series of uh, uh, cities about uh, working on temporary appropriation. And what I found very interesting is that two all the indicators tells us that the more you have you create space where people can use those beyond what is expected by design by the planning the more you have places in which uh, uh, i can say the, the success of the architecture can last as long as possible the, the, the building the, the space can become more resilient and more of this is about public space so i really find your project uh, uh, particularly uh, original because uh, you're making me thinking how this could happen if the public space which use exaptative approach is actually part of the complexity of building in which you make shape proliferates just to repeat this sorry if i seem uh, very um how can i say particularly interested obsessed by this this is exactly different between uh, uh, the deterministic design and the acceptation as a combination of the possibility to create resilience through, uh, through creativity. So their approach of uh, the, the possibility to make a structure resilient is not to give them a function with, the, how can I say, fixed space. This is the way, and we have a series of examples that makes this uh, structure uh, probably useless in a short period of time. And we demonstrate that we are incapable to create scenario this way. The proliferation of shape without the purpose make the possibility that this shape uh, can be co-opted for a certain function. So I think that the way you have operated seem particularly uh, resilient from, as I said before, from a biological perspective. So thank you very much for thank your you. Thank you for a great comment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alessandro. Unfortunately, we no longer have a break, so uh, we need to stay. My fault. Okay, I no, would say no a five more. break, Zaina, maybe. Uh, if people need it. Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm just logging in and logging out. Thank you for joining. Hi, Mariana. Nice hey, to see you. Thanks for having me, always. Mm -hmm. Wish I it's was in LA, but. <laughs> it's a pity we're not in LA, you know, well, the air is terrible, but if we're not in LA, well, you know, I mean, it's very different to walk the corridors. I've been walking through Zoom. Hi, Ila, nice to see you. Also, Ila was here, was it last year or the previous year? I don't remember. Uh, I think it was the previous year. The I previous year. Time, you know. This yeah, time, time compresses. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom. Alessandro, nice to, nice nice to, to see you. you, nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. I see Marcelo. Hi, Marcelo. Thanks for joining us. Sanfor, I see your I see your name there. So I, yeah, you know, um, here, nice to hear you. Uh, he has to run to pick up his son. He'll be right back. Okay. Okay. So he'll I'll just leave a note. Distance, distance. So he'll be right back. So saying, I don't know, as you like, if you want to give the critics a five minute break, a bathroom break, like, and then yeah. I feel like we probably need five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And if everybody's okay, we'll just add five at the end. Okay, thanks guys. So we'll be right back in five minutes and Luke, you can start.
Luke, are you ready? Hi, Luke. You're on mute. There we are. Hi, everybody. Perfect. Hey, we're looking at a black screen with two gray rectangles. I assume that's not what you want us to see. And the gray rectangles, do they come from us being able to, are those the rectangles of the Zoom window? Yeah. Is that why I mean, we see those? Better? Better, we still see them, they're on top and they're minimized. Can get our jurors back. <laughs> it's okay, while, while they're gone, we can make sure that you are well set up. Still there? No rectangles. Okay. Go to the next slide. Great. Yep, Better. can go back. Zena, how are the how are things at home? Is everything okay in Topanga today? Yeah, no, we're we dodged a bullet for sure. There was a fire mm -hmm. on uh, oh. fires on the canyon, the boulevard, but uh, the wind stopped. Okay, so we're okay. It's just really yesterday was smoky, um, mm -hmm. but it's just been kind of like gray, basically overcast. I think from all the from all the smoke, I imagine. Yeah. We were talking about you here, and um, and Sasha said, uh, Sani and John should just drive over to Brentwood and stay with us oh, okay. if anything happens. So. You know, we were, I told you we were helping John's sister. We were up uh, in Central California, and then we decided, mm -hmm. hey, Michael. Um, we Zana were, says, hi, Michael. We're going to come back on Thursday, and then when the fire started, we got kind of worried so we we drove back on tuesday or mm -hmm. was it wednesday wednesday sorry yeah um but so far so good mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a gamble <laughs> okay so mariana said we can start uh and i see oh here's alessandro Maybe let's wait a few more seconds for Isla and I imagine Sanford might be a little bit late, so we should just start when we have Isla. But yeah, I think it's actually worse on the east side right now because of the Bobcat mm -hmm. fire. I've got ash settling on my car if you're in. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I think well, we do too here in Highland Park. Very rare reversal. <laughs> Usually we're in deep trouble in fire season. Good to see you guys. Sorry, I was uh, now that hey. I can see everyone, you know, I want to formally say hi, you know. Well, I mean, it's Anna and Luke, it's really up to you. If you guys want to wait, we can wait if you'd rather start. Let's go. Um, Marcelo is here. Mariana is here. Alessandro is here. We're good. I think okay. we'll start. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm about time, so I think we should just do it. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Luke Falcone. I am an MARC 1, uh, and my thesis is titled Unoccupied. In a moment of stark political and cultural polarization, one of the few things that we as Americans still share in common are 640 million acres of public lands. While the responsibility for the management of these places falls on the federal government, our current presidential administration has been threatening the future of these lands since their first days in office. The purpose of this project is to explore how we as architects, citizens, and humans can better educate ourselves about our relationship with these places. Public lands act as strongholds against climate change, house vital wildlife populations, 
are important sources of income for rural communities and have become intrinsic to our national identity. Most importantly, these are homelands and remain sacred to many native peoples. Out of respect for both the history of these places and their inhabitants, it is vital that we learn how to preserve their future. I began this project studying the notion of void and in the etymological deep dive of the term, I came across the concept of the riderless horse. The history of horses in the American West is short but profound as unconscious agents of colonization and expansion. The void atop a riderless horse implies a subtraction and in that moment exists the opportunity to fill the void. While the horse stays the same, the rider that occupies the space becomes the agent acting upon the landscape. By shifting our perspective from passive observer to that of the rider, we are confronted by a new understanding of our own influence over these lands and begin to see our, rela our relationship with the land in a different way. Using the theme of the riderless horse, this project proposes a series of temporary monuments constructed on public land sites throughout the American West. Each monument is constructed of broad, starkly white painted walls that interfere with traditional perspectives and force viewers to engage at a more personal level. Cutouts of horses and figures allow people to place themselves into the context of the piece, essentially an elaborate face in a hole. Instead of looking out at the landscape they might have expected, they have turned their gaze backwards and are now confronted by onlookers, infrastructure, and the bureaucratic complexities that brought them there. At 40 feet wide by 12 feet tall, each piece is designed for quick construction and disassembly. Simple four by four lumber and four by eight plywood boards form the wall and silhouette that in turn conceals a standing platform. In front, a, pro a projector sits underneath a vertical glass pane where information can be projected and displayed. Deployment of each temporary monument required an exploration and documentation of the landscapes themselves. This meant understanding ecology and history both before and after a land session to the government occurred. This also included examining the different bureaucratic and administrative systems that manage these lands, including permitting, accessibility, and authorization practices. In order to fully engage on this front, I selected four different sites, each managed by one of the big four land management agencies. These agencies include the Bureau of Land Management, a subsidiary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, again, Department of the Interior, the National Park Service, yet again, Department of the Interior, and finally, the National Forest Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This thesis was, for lack of any other term, a road trip. Um, starting in upstate New York and proceeding all the way to stop at the following four sites. The Pawnee National Grassland, a Forest Service site in Northeast Colorado. The Arapaho National Wildlife Res Refuge, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Preserve, also in Colorado. The Gordon Creek Watershed in the Ruby Mountain Range of Nevada, a Bureau of Land Management site. And the Racetrack Playa, a dry lake bed located in Death Valley National Park in Central California, before finally arriving back here in Los Angeles. Whereas many monuments represent a distinct moment or event in history, these act in a much different manner. They are both temporary and adaptable. Their purpose is not to memorialize, but to intrigue and inform. As you can see here on the Pawnee Grassland site, subtle text appears projected on the glass panel when a viewer places themselves within the piece. The information listed in the text for each site includes the area and operator, the permit required for the construction of the monument itself, contracts being executed on the site, and most importantly, the original inhabitants and effective date of government appropriation. The stark white nature of the monuments act to shock and distinguish from their landscape. Their otherness questions what is natural in these places, what is not, and what our long-term influence on them has been. As noted here at the Arapaho National Wildlife Refuge, the permitting for these sites can be long and tedious, often revealing the bottlenecks and inconsistencies within the system. Despite being considered public lands, the bureaucracy behind these organizations can be isolating and confusing, resulting in either intentional or unintentional exclusion. Despite applying for my form 31383C, my application was not accepted. 
The figures embedded within these silhouettes, like that shown here in the Ruby Mountains, are intended to be obscure and undisclosed. Given the temporary nature of the monuments themselves, they are inherently interchangeable and in no way tied to their specific location. This keeps the focus on the perspective of the viewer and how they see their role in the greater scheme, not necessarily the influence of the iconic historical character. The intent of this project was not to answer questions that which I am not in a position to answer. As a white man, I recognize my perspective on the history of these lands as shallow. That being said, my hope for this project was to begin the unlearning process, shift what might have been an unaware engagement with our public lands to one of a, de of a degree of higher consideration and historical placement. Of course, as she usually does, Mother Nature outwitted me and did a similar project like this of her own. And it turns out the best way to get people to pay attention to something is to simply light it on fire. Thank you. Um, I will drop a Miro link in, uh, in the text here. And thanks. Thank you. to start this. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. Well, thank you very much, Luke. And by the way, <clears throat> very fascinating images. I think that is, well, uh, the aspect that I uh, like of your project the most is the fact that you are doing an operation. But again, as, as in the previous case, maybe I'm reflecting something that is not there. So I want to, to discuss with you the fact that in a way you are um, giving a completely different dignity to the uh, to the wild prairies or desert etc and very similar to the approach that in the past we had uh, with landscaping and uh, and uh, let's say um, historical gardens and so on so if this is the operation i find this very interesting is because there is a clear cultural shift in our brain uh, re related to biodiversity. I don't know. This is recently. I'm, uh, recently, I went to Eindhoven for a project, and what they, they are doing is uh, uh, the paving all the street. Uh, and uh, uh, and when I asked, okay, how is working? And they said, well, perfectly, because now all the problem, uh, uh, environmental problem that we have, we completely disappear. And say, do you have any major problem? He said, yes, the major problem is that uh, citizens don't understand this. They think that everything that is natural, if the, cut, the grass is not cut, is a problem, while uh, actually, um, actually is exactly the opposite situation. So I think that this operation of uh, giving a different dignity of uh, the uh, immense landscape or American landscape, uh, given different dignity to nature rather than to artificiality. So having a monument, which is a typical urban, uh, if understood well, an urban object in the middle of the prairie is like a gesture that uh, imply a cultural shift, which I uh, uh, totally appreciate. And so I find particularly interesting. So my question is, uh, I understood that these are also informative uh, uh, panels and elements. You said you don't want to uh, make real monuments, so you don't want to make this too celebrative, if understood well. Correct, yeah. I, I think, you know, I think there is a degree of cultural shift that's happening, like you, like you noted, and I think one of the things that we're starting to recognize is that there's actually a lot going on behind the scenes of these public lands that, um, you know, we kind of consistently think of them as kind of as the wild yeah. west and, and untouched. But um, yeah, if, if I can add just one thing, so I complete my question. Is, yeah. uh, so uh, I like very much also the fact you said not the celebration itself, but in a way, in a way, these these operates these uh, agents also operate, uh, let's say, on an ecological level or in increase the awareness of uh, ecology. Can you, if if it's correct, can you expand a little bit about these these uh, concept and how they do this? Uh, uh, if you think this is uh, what I understood is correct. 
So the ecological dimension, I'm very interested in this. Yeah, well, I think, you know, to kind of tie it back in the, the what we understand as the Wild West is actually a place that's, you know, being not ecologically left alone. So we are using it for extractive purposes. We are using it for grazing rights. We are using it for things like this. And I think for the everyday user, we don't necessarily recognize that. And so I think it's really, you know, using these monuments as a moment, not necessarily to, to celebrate anything, but to take a moment and recognize kind of your own um, role in, in stewarding these lands, right? And kind of ensuring their own, you know, it, it's, it's so easy to, to drive by them on the road and say, oh, that's a taken care of situation. And that's not always the case. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, this what you said remind me this, you know, nothing to do with the US, but the condition of Alberta, where you have this facade of trees, but in the back uh, you have uh, sort of uh, exploitation and not feeling of what is really happening in this uh, landscape, what is fake, what is real. I think this is a, an interesting topic, topic to be developed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, and, if I may... No, sorry, go ahead, Alessandro. No, no, it was something nothing to do with this, but uh, is the, Luca is the mo most important uh, Italian surname, so I want to celebrate this for a moment. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. In, in absolute, in the most important, really. A little bit moved, but maybe, Luca, you know what I'm referring to. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I was, I think, uh, Alessandro, some of the things you said were resonating with the um, some of the things I thought were uh, the most thought provoking or that I connected with personally. The first one was this notion that uh, uh, the, the, the thinking about the natural and the artificial or the coming, what are the mechanisms through how we can understand, sorry, that uh, these natural spaces are actually heavily regulated um, and behind what we see as empty space, uh, there's uh, authorities, legislation, uh, rights of use, of occupation, um, a lot of money uh, from maintenance to rights of exploitation, so on and so forth. So this idea again that this vastness or nothingness is actually far from being um, untouched territory and how the presence of actually human and human activity might be existing in different ways. That's an aspect of the thesis that I find super interesting that you uh, began kind of sharing and again, making visible um, a little bit of this information. And I think there's more to do there. <laughs> there's, there's more fabric to be um, sort of thread. The second thing um, uh, that I was super interested in was the way you started talking about the void uh, and the difference between void and emptiness and its relationship back to the landscape. Like many people would say the landscape is, you know, the space of emptiness compared to the space of the city. But I think it's a specific type of emptiness. Again, I wish you would have talked more about perhaps the void as something that usually is the result of an operation that we enact mm -hmm. and emptiness as nothingness. And the landscape that actually doesn't fit neither one of those criteria uh, seamlessly. I think that's super interesting. And at the scales at which you operate, because you have the figures of the horse and the man, and the emptiness or the void of the landscape is something which is so radically different that there's something, I don't know, that, again, a productive tension that I find there that I would like to see um, somehow more done with it. And in that sense, it made me think about um, your actually physical, the proposal for the physical intervention. You have these panel and the cutout and the, you give yourself enough frame such that the um, that the cutout is you know has a lot of uh, construction around it and then the background for me it would have been interesting to show um, again a little bit more images that contradict themselves an image for example where I can only see the landscape through the cutout another image where I begin to grasp the relationship between the physical space of the void, the physical space of the frame, and the impossibility or possibility of framing the physical space of the landscape. So again, you introduced all of these topics, but through the architectural intervention or the type of operations that you enacted operating as an architect, um, 
I think there's a lot more material that helps you not only represent the idea, but actually build, um, you know, um, some more depth into the questions that you're putting on the table. Um, and uh, and I think lastly, it would have been interesting. So I, I was at some point confused about which ones were collage and if you actually got to build one on site. Mm -hmm. Did you? I, I, it, I had every intention to do so. And um, that was, you know, I love that by the, the way. <laughs> the project was, was really to kind of be carrying around these, these big billboard like pieces. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that you brought up was the fact that uh, these places that we think are super unregulated, in fact, are quite regulated. Um, and so the number of bottlenecks and the number of, you know, barriers that I ran into, I kind of just wanted to go out to the middle of nowhere and build something. And it turns out you still can't do that. You, you should not use that. You should not use that phrase anymore, by the way. You're contracting yeah. yourself. This is not the middle of nowhere. This is definitely a destination. Um, no, the reason why I was um, uh, asking for that is because the effects of nature in your billboard would have made it such that after day one, literally by hour three, this would have not been white and clean anymore. And that fire that you sort of build in the argument and the dirt and the wind and things starting to grow. And, you know, somehow the landscape would have eaten this thing alive, yeah. uh, which is in, in a sense that it begins to fold into the conversation some other questions about the ways in which we tend to operate architecturally such that doesn't happen, the amount of maintenance that it requires, the amount of so on and so forth. So again, if it's about the simple act of putting a man-made structure in the middle of a landscape and see how one transforms the other, um, you know, the magnitude of the regulation, since it's a non-physical thing, it's enormous but then those roles somehow invert the moment that you get to the material um, operation. So and not to try to become like, you know, the, the poetic of the piece of wood or anything like that, but I just think that it's consistent with your reading of what's man-made, what's nature, and, and somehow what we understand to be the relationship between the two, um, which I find provocative. I just want the architecture operation to give you more variability within the project in terms of, again, what you build, how you measure it, what is the reaction to the physical space, uh, and, and what you learn, what's the feedback from that operation uh, beyond the collage that stays a little bit with the initial initial provocations of the project. Um, uh, hey, Luke. Congratulations. Uh, I'll just a couple of brief comments. And um, uh, first off, you know, you uh, great presentation, and it, 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 you put it together in a very kind of um, compelling and coherent way. So that's, and, and it would be, it's unfair to say we're disappointed you didn't actually build one because that, don't take it as a criticism. But you, I'm sure you were as well. I am more than anybody. I, think. You know, I just, there's, I'm betting you could have just done it without a permit and no one would know. And then it would have had a different kind of transgression. It'd be, it'd be amazing if you were arrested and then you'd have to, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not angry about that, but there is this idea of, um, it's funny, you know, so no, it's not funny. We're talking, as you know, there's a lot of monuments coming down. I'm doing a seminar in, in Chicago. We're, we're looking at these in depth and I was having a discussion with Jeff Kipnis who was saying, but, but the horses, can't you just leave the horse part there? Take off like Stonewall Jackson. It's just a horse. <laughs> and, and, but uh, you do, do mention, of course, the, yeah, okay. They're, Perhaps the animals themselves are innocent, but they were brought in as a part of, um, it is very much a kind of um, uh, colonial vehicle, literally. Uh, but so there is something about it that is sort of like um, more, mon so I don't know, I'm, one of the things I talked about in my studio is what's, is there, can we uh, separate monument as art versus architecture? maybe other times not so much and today maybe we do but yours is a kind of a monument i would argue and the idea of an empty horse is also i am not expert in these things but isn't that a kind of um symbol like in a in a funeral military funeral you would you would march an empty horse because of the person who's being buried this is, this is right right yes yeah so there's something really about loss there in an empty horse you know and, and uh, you know, I thought 
that was good. And I, you know, I see it more again as a kind of um, a memorial that just is, isn't, um, uh, it doesn't have that idea of permanence that it just shows up and then it disappears. These people in, they're not very interested, but in Philadelphia, there's people doing these things called, or was it Philadelphia? Maybe uh, paper monuments. The monument was just a bunch of billboards put up around town and then they get torn down and that's the monument. You know, and it has, so it has this, you know, it brings in this idea of the um, uh, fleeting kind of existence of it, which is usually the opposite of what we think, you know, make sure it's stone and bronze and everything so it stays up for a very long time. Anyway, um, thank you. I mean, I think strangely, well, first of all, congratulations, Luke. Uh, beautiful work. And I think what's strangely monumental about your intervention is, I've always said this, um, you've heard me say this many times, but the kind of infinite thinness of the sheet in the, in this vast territory is strangely monumental. And it's extremely, I mean, to, 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 to kind of take uh, Mariana's um, expression from the other presentation, like there's a kind of contradiction, I would say, between um, the quality and the kind of outline of the horse itself and its symbolism and history, especially in the kind of Americano of the US. Um, and then the infinite thinness of this thing that you would be placing um, in this vast landscape. I, I think that's really interesting. And um, it feels like it, it it speaks to also just the managerial, managerial nature of the concept of nature that maybe indirectly is coming up in your thesis. Um, that again, that, that the concept of nature in these um, lands are bureaucratic, they are paperwork, they are defined, um, they are presented um, in, in very specific definitions and very specific uh, images. Um, they are completely constructed. And I think that that's really interesting. And I find that the, while I am also disappointed, but I know we've had this discussion with you, Luke, and uh, about you know, building this at one to one, and you were disappointed more than any of us. Um, and then the white flat fire started, and all that. But I think, I think the way you've represented and sort of documented your your journey um, makes the, the thesis comes through, and I think it's quite visible in the way you've uh, presented it today. So um, I think we still understand the scope and the ambitions. Um, and I I should say it's a pretty ambitious project in that sense as well. Um, so anyway, but yeah, the infinite thinness is really interesting. Yeah, uh, maybe just to add another comment. I mean, thank you again, uh, Luke. I, congratulations. I think it's, uh, I enjoy your presentation. I think it's super, the, the sort of breadth of knowledge and uh, understanding, you know, from the sort of politics, the position to the site, uh, relationship with nature the managerial aspect as Saina was describing in terms of like how what it takes to really deal with this you know and and besides the sort of criticality that one could have the necessary uh bureaucrat you know the necessary bureaucracy that needs to exist in order to actually you know for us as sort of citizens and our kids and and and, and the kids of those kids to be able to still enjoy some of these conditions you know without being too uh, without sounding conservative, I think it's it's you know it's quite important. I think your project kind of encapsulates all of you know all of that. Um, I and I I mean and I love the way that you presented the sort of montage. I mean I I was thinking about the problem of abstraction. No, I think one of the things that be, besides the specifics of the information that your project is providing and and the reality that is maybe confronting. Um, it does operate at the realm of abstraction. It reminds me, obviously, of early minimalist sculpture, like you know Robert Smithson or somebody like Richard Nonas. Uh, of course, land art and so on. I mean, the fact that it introduces a kind of uh, sort of measurability into the into uh, something that is kind of infinite, that is unmeasurable, and in that creates a super super interesting. Uh, um, contrast no i mean i was also thinking of almost like a sort of micro version of like super studio you know where these things you know exist as abstractions in the site uh, creating another different landscape and creating this sort of you know frontality uh, maybe this is just like you know i know we're not to you know you set up your rules you set up your framework you set up the way you build it 
Uh, but I was thinking, in, in, you know, maybe this is related to, to Andrew's comment about what, what it would be different if an artist were to do something like this and an architect will do it. Or what will you think of the problem of permanence? Or even if you actually, uh, you're sort of producing something that maybe somebody else can go and do, you know, and let's say I could, this, I could pick three other sites and sort of DUI, like I will do it myself, let's say. And would that be a problem? Or, you know, much like the kind of role of minimalist cultures, there will be not only a certain phenomenology of the site in relation to the piece of art, but the piece of art itself as an object, the materials, you know, uh, whatever that is in relation to that site will really be a kind of point of, of contention. And I think you, you've got that. I will be slightly critical because of the context you're operating of the materiality and how that actually relates and produces uh, anything that is that could be understood as more than just a kind of a, a, a Burning Man kind of little installation or a kind of Coachella sort of pavilion in a way. And, and again, maybe I'm the one that is sort of uh, antiquated when it comes to this, but I think I think it's important to to consider that uh, not to say, well, you know, if we make it in like some sort of, you know, sheet of marble that would be cut perfect, would be better than what you're doing or it will sustain fire and so on. But I'm just thinking like uh, even experientially, even at the level of approaching this, even in terms of weathering, what it would actually do over time. And I think I will encourage you to think uh, in that sense, let's say more as a sort of sculpture and artist and not so much as a kind of maybe conceptual artist where you're producing a kind of a, a commentary and then other people can go and build. And again, you could say I'm more interested in the latter than the, than the former, uh, and then the discussion will probably sort of pull back and, and, and we can just stay discussing the concept. Because I think you've got the politics, you've got everything figured out, but I would, I would want to kind of tune in a little bit more without, uh, you know, without affecting your idea, your conception of what architecture appears needs to be in this particular case and in your, and in your understanding of things, uh, but really sort of push it forward so there's maybe I don't know if I went there last year and I go this year, there's going to be a difference. Maybe in this case, there would be a difference, but maybe in this case, there might not be anything, you know, next year. Uh, the fire may have ravaged it or the thing will become just too dirty and for the whiteness to, to really kind of uh, produce the effect that you are taking on, you know. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, I, I wouldn't kind of advocate for the phenomenology, but I think given the sort of your minimalist approach to the problem, you really might need to kind of take that on uh, full and understanding, you know, is it like one piece? Is it an assembly? I mean, are the seams when the thing begins to kind of weathering, not going to be anything interesting. It's just going to be paint. I mean, I think the, the context that you're dealing with is a very different one than, than, than working inside a gallery, let's say. And I think that's something that maybe your, your, your thesis needs to take on. But listen, it's a great project. And I think you got the DNA completely uh, Luke, and maybe sometimes you for either, I don't hear things or you don't say, were this, if you had got the permit, would you build it and take it back down again? And is that the model or would you just leave it there to weather? Uh, most of the permitting situations are all temp you know, temporary. So you'd have to put it up and take it back down. My understanding of the kind of the best in my conversations with different groups was that um, the best way to earn different ranges and things like that was to kind of frame it as like it was a like you know, I, think, I think you can, you can do that as part of the project, you know, then it sets the converse, you know, that it's, it's there. Some people see it, that's it, and then it's gone. And that's, you know, I mean, yeah. within an art practice, this would be an accepted, you know, way of doing something. Some people take Burning Man very seriously, I'm told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put into the chat because, um, Burning Man, Andrews, my, yeah. these are all the same to me. They're all... <laughs> skateboarding parks i mean burning man is kind of an amazing comment because um i put into the chat also just following marcelo's and andrew's comments the reminder of the little axiomatic diagram uh from rosalind krauss's essay sculpture in the extended field that actually andrew and i spoke about yesterday with our visual studies classes but i thought it would be nice to just bring it back because as marcelo is saying um your work uh look has as much to do with the contemporary monuments discourse as it maybe has to do with the idea of kind of um, bringing a, a large intervention into a landscape and outside of the gallery or outside of the School of Architecture. So I thought that would be a nice, a nice way to kind of begin to rethink the, 
the current political problem that we we all have um, with monuments. And uh, one thing that I was reminded of, because when you were working on this, I reread the essay by Krauss, was that um, she kind of uh, puts into one category all monuments that have to do with figuration. You know, the Marcus Aurelius on a horse sitting in the center of Campidoglio by Michelangelo, right? So kind of the system of uh, of power that gets established by that in and then juxtaposes or kind of opposes that to the modern 1970s uh, kind of movements into the field and into material culture, etc. And in a way, there are two models that she provides that are uh, one that's a little bit more architectural, the other one that's uh, extremely architectural, but like urban power um, and nothing in between. And what I was struck by as you were working on your project was that you actually develop the in-between um, in the sense that you have both figure and field, both pedestal and backdrop, but always being populated by the audience. And I think that, that there's an incredible power to the, to, the, to the image that you propose. And of course, it's also standing not on a pedestal, but on a pedestal of paperwork. And so just to kind of put it all in perspective, I think like, Today is not the end of the project, but in a way, a kind of starting point, because now you have um, an image that you can send back to the authorities. <laughs> and, you know, I would wait for a couple of months. Hopefully the election goes well um, so that you can actually begin to reenact it because the enactment hasn't actually taken place yet. Um, and I think that what you're doing is so it's, it's very strange to say, because my patriotism right now is at its height. Um, towards the United States, not Russia, that is. But um, it, because I'm, I'm very hopeful, by the way, following the summer's event, um, I really think that you have proposed an American monument, like something that kind of reinterprets not this kind of idea of pure minimalism, not the idea of a kind of urban public space, but something else. And in my um, just kind of seeing your project being presented today, I realized that the fact that you got into the car and drove through this landscape and documented yourself walking, my favorite image is the walk through the, uh, through the forest and then you, know, you appear again in the next frame and the next frame. I think that's a kind of monument in, its, in and of itself. I mean, we all did it. I, I'm certainly all of us Americans have driven across the country as a rite of passage through the landscape. And I, I think that is so familiar and so important to capture. So in many ways, um, I'm very grateful to have uh, worked with you on this project and very excited to see how it moves forward, how you move it forward into the landscape. It must go up, it must go there. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you so much. You, it was really a pleasure working with you and uh, thanks again, everybody. Um, do we have actually time for yes. a small comment? Yeah. I, I love that you. I love that you brought the Rosalind Krauss diagram, but also the text, uh, um, the expanded field. Because I was thinking in some of the work in the references uh, to Brancusi's columns, I always love looking at the photographs when the columns are in the context of the landscape, but then the same columns in the context of his studio in Paris. And uh, so I think again the question that came up before now, I can't remember who asked on how this project would inflect whether you're thinking you're doing it as an architect versus as an artist. And then I think that can be even unpacked further, whether if you're operating as a photographer, as a sculptor, like somebody that builds things in three dimensions uh, or as a landscape um, artist, uh, because I think all of those disciplines um, with their material cultures and their output and their formats, um, they actually, might take on the same subjects, but um, use them and manipulate the matter in very different ways. And then sometimes again, they meet somewhere discursively or they, they do not. And maybe now again that Anna brought this article, it makes me think that again, all the comments of what I was asking for the photo that is completely framed or the photo that uh, shows the context and this as an object, it goes back to the question of figuration of this piece, right, as well. So I think that is extremely interesting in a way that it also could be mapped into other acts of architecture that we might consider more conventional. Because and I, now I feel like in all the conversations we had, the three students we saw, 
at some point we could have spent time talking about foreground and background. And I know in some conversations it became more explicit than in others, but that brings us also back into the table, right? The notion of the active background or the non-active background or the figure, etc. So again, it's both like uh, forward, but it touches on, on, I think, issues of architecture that are baseline, um, which I find very interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I was looking at your animation uh, on Nero, the, of the billboard or the kind of monument uh, construction. And I kept thinking that, you know, the, the video that you set up of yourself sort of walking, uh, the, the documentation of your journey, um, I kept thinking, what if the billboard or what if the monument is also a moving object uh, or even a moving target in the landscape? Like uh, right now, it's it's understood and represented as this very static thing. And maybe to to bring up Marcelo's point, like it's static in terms of its um, sort of aging and sort of entropy uh, 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 properties, meaning it re it's represented as though it doesn't ha belong to any kind of cyclical or seasonal. Uh, you know, system, but it, but it's also static in that it's always placed in very specific positions. And I, I was really curious to hear why you made that decision because I think you know you could put it on wheels in a very kind of simple way, um, very literal and direct way, and it could start to capture um, the the moving, let's say, uh, uh, conditions of of the landscape landscape it's in but it could also just be repositioned and maybe even uh, whoever's there, uh, not just the, sort of the author can move it, but also whoever's uh, uh, in the park. Um, so I'm just curious, like what, what were your thoughts? I'm looking at it again here about why it would have to be static and sort of positioned in a very particular way uh, on the site. It, yeah, it's funny that, that you bring that up because I think, um, a lot of times I never saw it as static because I, I always kind of envisioned if I actually did build it, I would document the whole thing in the same way. So you'd see it, you know, you'd see it come up, you'd see it disassembled, and then we'd go on to the next spot. So it was never really gonna, you know, settle itself in one spot for that long anyway. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's dynamic in how it moves from site to site, but once it's on the site, it seems to be documented as uh, still, and it's also seemed to be documented uh, from very sort of specific points of view uh, and, and uh, directions, um, assuming as though there would be like an X, you know, on the site where uh, if I were visiting, I would have to kind of stand up there to look, which would be, you know, through the, stem the stencil cut, the cut out of the monument, which could be one way of looking at it. Um, but I think the, to some extent, like the, the, the general atmosphere of your thesis um, feels uh, moving and dynamic um, on all fronts, on the managerial and bureaucratic front, on the kind of like nature quote front. Um, but yeah, I would just invite you to think through how you might maybe in the future represent all this in a more dynamic way uh, so that it sort of does some of these ideas more justice. Because again, they um, maybe their monumental nature is not through their kind of um, stillness, but rather through their uh, constant um, change and transformation and movement in that, in that landscape and in that site. Can, can I add a comment to this? Because I find it's Alessandro, it's hard. Ah. Yes, I can hear you now, uh, but okay. quickly, because then we'll go to the next student. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, no, sorry. Uh, the comment was more like, uh, because I didn't get that this was this is a move uh, in other place. Uh, and uh, because I was making the same reflection, uh, the same consideration that Zena and in a different way also Marcelo was doing. But now that uh, I understood these things, I'm reconnecting this. So it's more uh, brainstorming, reconnecting this to what you said, Anna, about uh, a very American story. And uh, I don't know, alternatively, uh, either, yes, you tell the story, but another thing that will be very fascinating, probably for uh, a Southern uh, European like me, that for me, if I think about America, I think about uh, uh, on the road, probably obvious, 
too, too much obvious from on the road Jack Kerouac and so, so I don't know if it, in the narrative uh, this could be part so if the point is to move and this become an on the road monument which is something that of course doesn't exist anywhere less than in America I think this will be an interesting story to tell uh, in a further development so the Jack Kerouac monument I don't know just uh, Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Anna. Thanks, Luke. Show in Thanks, Alessandro. Congrats. I agree. Um, so Sanford just texted that he's going to be here any second. Uh, and I think that John is joining us. John May. He's, he's right there. I'm testing my mic. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Cool. Should I begin? Sure. Hi, Wendy. Sure. Wait for Hi. a second, Wendy. How's Tiziano? Great. Huge. I'm sure. <laughs> he was big when he came out. He was like this big. <laughs> Enormous. <laughs> yeah, that monster. Does he stand up yet? Does all for a few seconds at a time. Nice. He's ready to, he's ready. To, he's going to walk any day. Amazing. <laughs> okay, I think we can get started, Wendy. Okay. I've already introduced everybody. Else. Okay. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Wendy Guerrero. Uh, the title of this thesis is the US Embassy in Havana, the medium is the message, um, which is a term coined by media philosopher Marshall McCullen. Uh, this thesis project focuses on the image of buildings, more specifically the po uh, political cultural representation and the performance that happens around diplomatic relationships and the need to be seen and unseen. I began my analysis by compiling an image data set of 135 US embassies that are listed on usmbc.gov. This is a contact sheet of all the images I have collected. The U.S. has presented an image in foreign territories through a particular building typology, the embassy. In some cases, it acts as a cultural messenger, in others, a show of force, and in few, apathy. As we understand it, the U.S. embassy is a place of diplomacy that bridges two nations and its citizens. Those diplomatic relationships are always in flux. The current embassy typology deals with its presence in the host city and the struggle of equilibrium in a society that is constantly changing, which causes tension with these permanent buildings. However, the current MC typology does not allow for flexibility or ambiguity. The US Embassy and Consulate are designed and built based on what is referred to as the Overseas Building Operation Code, known as the OBO. In here, you'll find occupancy requirements, protection features, finishes, energy efficiency requirements, amongst other rules and guidelines. Reproducing an image of their foreign policy through this architectural DNA. Through this visual analysis, I noticed there's a difference between the U uh, how the US a Department of State, journalists, civilians, and Google Maps images these embassies, and I found discrepancies between the representations and documentation of embassies by different actors. So based on these findings, I chose to work on the U.S. Embassy in Havana. The U.S. and uh, Cuban diplomatic relationship has been and still is a complex one. And what we're seeing on the screen are unrestricted photos from the U.S. National Archive, a selection of curated photos available to us. Built in 1951, the U.S. Embassy sat near empty for uh, over six decades and just recently during the Obama administration uh, resumed its full consular activities. Tension throughout those decades were caused by conflicting political ideologies. There is a particular episode that compelled me to choose this site. The U.S. used their embassy to broadcast pro-democracy messages from their facade um, and through their windows, choosing an attempt to control through architecture. Cuba responded by the erection of field of flags to block the embassy. And those flag pulls sit in a plaza named the Anti-Imperialist Plaza. The site has a stage and exemplifies the needs for building in flex instead of a building in control. I indexed the, prescri uh, prescri indexed the prescribed materials and methods from the OBO and proposed an updated catalog of materials that create reflections, obfuscations, transparencies, amongst other effects. With these respective cultural, social, and political applications, these are materials that allow for intro and extroversions, resolutions, control, accessibility, inaccessibility, and optical deceptions reserved for the state. My intervi intervention consists of two main gestures. 
the gutting of the tower, and the insertion of a rig at a building scale. This rig has movable parts, such as cameras, projectors, and lighting systems. The movement of what I'm referring to as optical planes facilitates the appearance and disappearance of images and materials against the stable, relentless grid of the embassy's facade. So here is the rig, um, a photo of the rig actualized where I'm testing these ideas of visual deception and manipulation. So first we have two-way mirrors and surveillance to reflect, a controlled area and an uncontrolled area where the viewer is hyper aware of its own constant visibility. Next, we have the theme splitter glass in the presidential teleprompter. To convince, influence, indoctrinate, glass functions to separate spaces, increase, invisib increase visibility, and reduce accessibility. It is expression of inequalities of power. RF attenuation film and security to conceal. These films act as a barrier against unwanted listeners. Lenticular blur film and resolution to confuse. By using horizontal parallax, the film allows for horizontal passage, but reduces the resolution of vertical objects to conceal. The green screen and camouflage, sometimes functioning as both window and mirror, which hides and reveals. Analysis of transparency, opacity, dissolution, and camouflage are rooted in architectural discipline by the way of Roland Slutsky, De Palma, Mustafi, uh, to name a few. We know that transparency is a simultaneous image of separated and spatial locations. It produces a dichotomy of introversion and extroversion, a subject and an object, and of course, both literal and phenomenal transparency by overlapping planes and the transparent uh, ceases to be that which is perfectly clear and instead becomes that is clearly ambiguous. However, these analyses on the screen deal with the image and its political and cultural inheritance and the materials agency. Here, the two-way mirror inverses, the beam splitter glass informs, the green screen confuses, the film protects, um, and the lenticular dissolves. In these studies, we see suppression of depth and the definition of light sources where visual hierarchies are defined, they are flattened and collapsed. They are no longer have any reference to a position or a station point. The implementation of the rig aims to delaminate materialized power to begin understanding a building in flux by instigating new operations, hierarchies, symmetries, and organizations that are typically fixed in the authority relations. The rig is also needed to produce simultaneity. Conditions are dynamic, not always visible or always hidden, but rather always both layered components of a single social service surface. So I'll be performing an intervention on the US Embassy in Cuba. It currently sits at the edge of Havana along the Gulf of Mexico. It is a tower and plinth typology. The plinth is where most of the consular activities are performed um, and the diplomatic activities in the tower. It is a permanent structure controlled through building. The intervention is within the tower um, while the plinth is free to resume its normal consular activities. This is a diagram of the tower as a rig. Um, in the same space, the actors and spectators occupy the levels of opacity and transparency, which blurs the roles and spaces. Using the unrestricted photos from earlier, I place them into the respective positions in and around the embassy to recreate the spaces and determine discrepancies. These are unrestricted images or images that are meant to be seen. I chose three rooms in the plinth and three in the tower to test the catalog of materials and effects that I've curated within the rig. Much like the rig, these rooms employ the dynamis dynamism of layers of planes, images, and rigs. It uses optical effects, both materiality um, and organizationally. These case studies deal with the foreground and background and reveal and reversal, uh, transformation of space and power, material as an interme intermediary, reversal and direction of influence, shades of existence, and a backdrop for acting. Um, so I have modeled these little rooms um, based on the catalog of photos. Um, so for each of these slides, you'll see the catalog of photos at the bottom that were used to recreate the space. And then also some call outs to some of the um, uh, material changes and updates. So 
here's a model where two of these rooms meet and the exchange of visual and physical accessibility by the way of these materials. Um, this is a hallway where two of these um, rooms that I modeled meet. And here um, in this hallway, we see where three of these materials um, kind of uh, join and are used to create uh, one of these optical deceptions. So by the way of opticality, performance, and the implementation of the rig, we begin to address the problem of, fi of a of fixing a building into a state of constant change by instigating new operations of hierarchies, symmetries, and organizations that are typically fixed in authority relations. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Do you have a link that you'd like to share? I have the Miro board. Um, let me see if I can find the link. It might be useful because you're going a bit too fast. Oh, okay. So we we may need to just kind of refer back to some slides. Mm -hmm. Definitely do that. Wendy, may I ask? Just a kind of technical question and, and I'll pass the mic to our guests. I'm just curious because the model you show is so so beautiful and so fascinating as an as a mechanism for understanding your interest in optics and in materials. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious whether you see it as a um, model to represent the building uh, as a kind of conceptual model or if you see it more literally, I mean, you spoke a little bit about literal phenomenal, but I, I guess I want to shift that question to the role that your model plays in our understanding of the building, um, whether whether it literally does what you are suggesting with your hands in the in a kind of in the urban setting. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely did start as a conceptual model, um, and with these planes, they kind of for these optical phenomena to um, to actually work, they need to be moving. So what started as like, you know, a conceptual model as a break became the actual project. So I do see it as a as a larger building move. Can I ask maybe just a, a related question? The these seem to imply like the um, uh, the news crawl that this is something that's for the outside. And then the later studies, it seems to be something that's interior to the embassy itself. Mm -hmm. Is it one or the other, or is it both? It's both. Um, so against the facade, you kind of start to see these planes kind of move and start to blur, but inside you're going to see these kind of up close as well. Um, Wendy, maybe you could show the the model for the newer model photos um, that slide where you, you show the effects that you've done in the interior just to, in contrast. Yeah, Wendy, could you also go back and um, uh, just talk about the, the site a bit? 
I, that, that I didn't catch um, the relationship between a lot of the optical studies and the kind of um, empirical context. Sure, um, there is definitely a point uh, this summer where the images kind of start to inform the, the project as much as these materials that I was looking at. Um, I found these, this amazing like trove of, um, of um, unrestricted photos from uh, the US um, National Archive. Um, so by using these, I kind of started reconstructing the tower and the plinth. Um, and then there was also an episode um, in the 90s, early 2000s, where um, during the Bush administration, they were um, broadcasting pro-democracy um, images onto the facade. Um, things like Jeb Bush, pro-democracy, um, things about communism. Um, and so that also kind of propelled me to choose this site. Wendy, can I, um, can I ask you, because I'm, I'm trying to understand the specific deployment of your catalog of interventions uh, in relation to their intentions, you know, both at the scale of the whole building on the facade and within the, the specific uh, rooms that you've selected. So maybe I can ask you to um, unpack that a bit, because obviously, you know, you talked about kind of delaminating power, uh, you're using strategies that are uh, related to optical deceptions, ambiguity, obfuscation, etc. And we could argue that, you know, those strategies are strategies that, um, that political powers might be using on a regular basis. So maybe you can tell, tell us what, what you're trying to do through those uh, through those interventions themselves? What, what do you want to achieve through that? And it's more about your intentions. Right. Um, so these kind of started as the, the OBO code where they, they start to call out things like the RF film, which is attenuation film, um, things that we know like two-way mirrors, um, and then beam splitter glass, which isn't you know in the OBO, but is used as a political device to, um, to conceal like what they're reading off of it. And so I was kind of started to use these against the state or to kind of start blurring these like clear, um, these clear powers of these materials and what we understand from them and kind of start like playing them against each other. How, how do they start flipping, let's say that political narrative, right? Because, uh, uh, if you take any one of those elements, you know, two-way glass that enables uh, somebody to operate, you know, uh, somebody to be under surveillance without knowing or what's happening in the background. How are, what are the devices that you're using to change that? Uh, because if you're taking on that catalog of, um, of materials or devices, what are you doing with it by reusing it? And how does that reuse change that, that narrative in your mind? Right, so I started with the rig to kind of start testing these because in order for these to start working, they need to start being on some type of apparatus or what I'm calling the rig. Um, so when we come across these materials um, in the real world, they're kind of stationed, there's a station point um, and there's a, def a definite uh, kind of dichotomy of power or the observer and the unobserved. So by putting it on the rig, they kind of start kind of bumping into each other, going into each other, and they start kind of confusing each other. And that's where I think the delamination of power exists. There's a, it seems like, and just maybe this is a follow-up to, to Isla's question. Um, and for, first of all, it was a great presentation, Wendy. I, I appreciate the way it's put together and, and the things were, so these questions really come from the, the sort of clarity of, of what you did show. Um, so if you have a, um, a blank wall between two rooms, you can't see what's going on or in the outside of a building. And if you put in a glass, then you can. And then if it's a kind of one way mirror, well, that could be like a police lineup or a kind of observation. Uh, and then very, so there's various kinds of, or, you know, the lenticular glass, which maybe is just for fun and for effect. 
And so it seems like some of these have a, uh, let's say sinister, but let's say a certain way of, of controlling information and, and, and not, and others are just interesting effects. And I guess there's a, like, is there a kind of politics to what is there? You know, cause you, there's also the thing as you talk about transmission wave, weren't they blasting all of these radio waves that was making everyone get brain injuries? <laughs> yeah, it was causing people to get really sick. There is um, some type of radioactive, not radioactive, but some type of radio waves or something. Yeah, I don't. It sounded like one of those things that people who put aluminum foil on their head. Yeah, are, that was definitely something so, that. So I, I guess there's there's a it 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 all the 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 way you talk about it and things you show all imply a certain kind of politics, subversion, irony, uh, but it, it there isn't. I, I guess it isn't sort of. I don't see the. I don't get the kind of diagram of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in the initial studies, I was looking at both the optical effects, but also the cultural and social implications. Um, so as far as how they sit in the rig or in the tower, there's no, um, I guess, relationship to that. Um, we can go through the diagram. Um, so this diagram kind of helps a little where there's like these levels of opacity and transparency and different actors that would um, kind of move through the tower. And so the white, uh, the white are the civilian, the gray is the admin and diplomat, and then the black is, you know, these agencies that exist in these embassies, but no one really talks about. We are not even supposed to know that they're there. Um, so they're kind of supposed to kind of shift through these. Um, and so they can kind of start this tension where they're next to each other, but they don't see each other or they see each other as no accessibility um, or it's inversed. Um, so I guess that's closer to what the diagram is. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can, uh, oh, go ahead, Maria. Um, hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking that um, Anna in the previous project um, brought the relationship of uh, these topics to the November election and how charged our current political uh, context is. Um, and somehow I, I want the project to be um, perhaps politically more, more charged. C can you hear me well? My, it seems that it is. Yeah. Um, so you, you start by yeah, identifying a site that has a very tense political history, the relationship between uh, Cuba and America. You identify the embassy as the vehicle for um, sort of consulate affairs um, and, the, and, and as the space where this relationship between, again, government and people is uh, mediated. And then you identify the building um, as a surface for the uh, broadcast of political propaganda. I mean, that is so charged to begin with. And somehow I think you went with a version, I, I love the model. I have a personal interest in uh, kinetics in architecture. And I think certainly there's a world around that, but somehow it seems to me that your thesis is not about designing envelopes, uh, whatever their characteristics are, but part of it, it is as a mechanism to do other things. Um, and somehow I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find in the project the charge of the, of the message. So I, I want to, I think the version I like the most of the project is the one where architectural, architecture takes on that role through image making, through its uh, physicality, materiality, uh, tectonics, etc., to participate into uh, landscapes that are more immaterial and in this case, again, extremely political. So when I see the kind of beautiful animations, I am waiting to find, you know, the subliminal message that I didn't get to see, but that somehow is going to be in my mind or understand how is that going to affect the people that work inside? If indeed this is not just an envelope for the exterior, but also um, as a device that transforms how we occupy space. So it's almost like perhaps what I'm asking is to take on some aspects of the thesis and intensify them to see 
the efficacy of, or the, even the capacity of architecture to operate as such. Uh, again, I'm thinking architecture as billboard, Venturi, you know, things like that. But then I'm thinking again, Cuba embassy, November elections. So what, what's your stance on that? What, what do you want to project on these surfaces? And, and I'm not asking for you to declare yourself any political allegiance. I just want to understand really what do you imagine? You show the photo of M Melania Trump uh, reading a discourse through the same optic device that now you're using at an architectural scale. So you know what I mean? Like it's those provocations have, are there, but then the project turns into a kind of like a friendly version uh, aesthetic. It's almost like, almost like decorative, right? Like you're choosing like the pattern and the colors. And I don't know, do you think you, you can fulfill that aspiration of the, you know, the updated or the new kind of uh, agent coming from architecture as a political agent? Right. So, so my proposition is turning the embassy into a rig, right? So before we understood the building as like a very rigid building um, architecture to control because it doesn't really start to move with the society, right? So sometimes we have really good um, relationships with certain countries and sometimes they turn within like a day or a week. So this kind of starts to address this idea of architecture as being movable and as a rig. And I guess that was my what my intention was uh, with the thesis was kind of making this building start to move so I can change with the society and have this kind of um, less tension in between the two countries. So you are more in the tropes of the kinetic building, would you say that that's where your energy went for the thesis? I wouldn't say so much kinetic, but it was just kind of the building being able to be flexible um, and through this, it was the rig because of the planes. Um, but I would, I'm not sure if the kinetic part of it would be, would be the answer. All right, I'm gonna think a little bit about your answer, and maybe I'll have another okay. another look for it. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can um, start. I mean, first, I want to say hi to all the faces on the screen. I haven't seen all of you in a long time. Uh, exactly. The tragedy, tragedy of Zoom is that we we finally get to see each other, but we're not actually with each other. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, Wendy, you know, I mean, I, I spent all of last year advising a thesis, an embassy thesis, uh, Ian Miley's thesis at GSD, and I also know that you chose this topic before you were aware of his project, but I also know you're aware of his project. So I just, maybe we'll talk about some overlaps that are, there's no way I can talk about it because I spent so long working with him on it. Um, uh, there's something... I came to see the embassy, when he first told me he wanted to work on it, I, I was sort of like disappointed um, because in my mind, embassies were sort of like hospitals and prisons where they are not really, they're so code, they're so code heavy that I was worried he was wandering into a kind of like morass of, of sort of like governmental obfuscation and regulation. But um, what I, ca I came to see the embassy as not so much about the embassy, but as a as, a, as an incredibly productive vehicle for asking extremely contemporary questions about architecture and media um, and mediation. And uh, so I just will say a few things about that. I think um, there are, there's a way in which, uh, and I think this is what your project is beginning to talk about, especially some of the models. There's a way in which the, the, the very hard boundary, the very hard traditional boundary that, that literally was a kind of physical tectonic boundary in most cases between front of house and back of house becomes instead this, this very complex sort of manifold field of practices, techniques, and materiality. And I think of that as the front of house, back of house becoming the foreground background, where if we think of the front of house, back of house as, as a kind of very rigid division within, and there's all these binaries, stagecraft, statecraft, diplomacy, duplicity, Right? And within the history of diplomacy, the idea that diplomats, even long before Ronald Reagan, that diplomats understood that their jobs were to be actors in a quite literal sense, right? Their job was to enact statecraft. So I, what's interesting to me is that how that um, resonates with traditional categories of solid void as we understand them tectonically. So if we look very closely, let's say, um, or at least in a, in a general sense, if we look at uh, the history of Pochet as one of moving from solid solid stereotomic solidity to hollow solid 
where the plenum gets introduced through the kind of assembled uh, wall cavity. Within diplomacy and within the, the embassy, that plenum space, and it's interesting because this, we talk about a, a, plenar, a plenary within governmental discourse. So the plenum is this kind of, this kind of like simultane, simultaneously architectural and political idea, right? But within the plenum, you get, you, suddenly the plenum has to take on this kind of third set of, of activities which is optical in its characteristics, right? And I think that's what your rig and, and your, also your second model is trying to say, that that inner space can no longer be fully concealed. And here we have another set of like diplomatic terms like unmasking, for example, that's been in the, in the news recently. Um, and so I, I, want to see, I want to think about and talk about your project maybe along the lines of a kind of transformation within the tectonic of the plenum which has which i think has reverberations well beyond the embassy as a program type and it has much more to do with architecture's participation in certain kinds of optical effects and i think on that in that regard it's uh um it's it the, the thesis raises a lot of questions and it's extremely su successful in in doing that I wanted to add to John's comments um, because in, a, in some se sense um, you, you, you spoke about media and mediation. And I, I was thinking, uh, Wendy, that the thing, when, when we talk about transparency, not in architecture, but in the kind of the politics, when, you know, what you've done in a way is like you said, there's transparency, literal and phenomenal. And then you said in the Trump administration or there's complexity and contradiction in the Trump administration. Like you just kind of add that little statement and then all of a sudden the terms actually completely shift because when we think about transparency in the Trump administration or opacity or what that means, um, we're reminded even most recently um, that it's through the media. And so that, that, that there is a kind of relationship that would have to be established through the programmatic discursive kind of dialogue between uh, those who occupy the building and those who, in a way, record its everyday uh, goings-ons. And the ones who are doing the recording and the ones who are doing the documentation are, of course, the ones who are also asking for literal transparency. And so somehow, um, the question that I think Andrew raised and we kind of been speaking about is asking you to produce a political position or to kind of disclose your own a little bit. Mariana said, maybe it's okay not to disclose it, but I really do feel that there is an importance once we move from uh, the word transparency in architecture to the word transparency in politics, um, where you place the kind of the effects within this construction and who gets to be on what side of the effect is actually quite important. And, you know, this is like, I'm not even talking about the relationship to Cuba and uh, the kind of post-Castro uh, moment, which is not really post, but um, there, there, I'm, I'm simply saying that even, even, even if we don't account for the setting, uh, we can always account for the kind of responsibility that, let's say, uh, the media brings to the actors within this building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has been definite. Oh, yes, Sam. No, no, please go. Ahead. No, no, no. It was, it was just a filler. It's fine. <laughs> I, I guess what I, I wanted to follow up because I, I think it's a really interesting conversation, and maybe Wendy, what you were trying to do when you brought up literal and phenomenal, and as Anna was saying, added Trump, 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 um, or you know, in our contemporary times, let's say, strange times. I think you're, what you were trying to do is you're trying to position maybe the work within an existing discourse. And I really appreciate that um, you were uh, clear about that. I think maybe what you, you were asking throughout the summer, um, how can transparency to some extent have political and cultural uh, dimensions to them? And perhaps the critique of um, maybe the Slutsky and, and your argument is that um, it, we remained within a kind of phenomenological spatial uh, paradigm and maybe we did not uh, go beyond that. Um, and that a more contemporary, let's say, way of looking at that argument would be one in which you would add 
Trump at the end of the sentence, essentially, one in which you would actually consider mm -hmm. the kind of new uh, definitions and new dimensions of these concepts today and what that would mean. Um, and I think while the materials, just to maybe follow up on some of Mariana's points, while the materials appear as being appliqué or um, perhaps one could say superficial and ornamental or decorative in, in that sense, while they appear as such and while they appear as having uh, a kind of beautifying dimension to them, I think that they're extremely strange and they are calibrated so that they can be beyond just decorative in that they change the way we navigate as actors in the building. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if this is coming through today necessarily, but I think that that was the intention early on. Um, when you made the decision of cut, gutting the tower and of, of using planes almost exclusively to create what John was saying, a kind of strange tectonic crochet that is beyond uh, the traditional concept of mass and void, I think your, your intervention is something along the lines of like appliqué with compounded with organi planimetric organizational and sort of sectional decisions can, can create um, deceptive and, and very ambiguous uh, um, uh, scenographies in an embassy. So, so actually you're learning a ton from um, theaters. You're, not, you're learning a ton from scenographic studies, scenographic designers. You're sort of operating like a scenographer to some extent. Uh, uh, and coupled with maybe the kind of architect's hat and, and the sort of OBO code, you're ending up with something very unexpected in that sense mm -hmm. um, that may not be. So this is my reading of the way, you know, over the summer and the way you've sort of developed this thesis. I think you're sort of working more as a scenographer um, than an architect, which I think is, is interesting. And so whether we could say that this is literally a kin kinematic um, or kinetic, excuse me, facade, or whether this is just a kind of um, act of scenography, I think is on is a question on the table. Mm -hmm. Meaning maybe this doesn't actually move at one to one. I see it as an act of imperial domination. So in many ways, it's a very pacifist project because instead of starting a war, you're adding, and when did you use your own words from the midterm, a kind of Trojan horse into this context. And so if we can talk about a kind of pacifism through architecture, I would absolutely love that. Um, and, uh, and in some ways, we're just gonna have to wait for a different president perhaps to to take charge of a building that has um, so much opacity to it that, that we kind of have to trust those within the walls that it's being used correctly. Mm -hmm. But there's there's so little trust today. I yeah, just I just wanted to say it's gonna close down. Uh, I thought it was an incredibly beautiful, even almost perfect project in so far as the ratio of um, attempted ambition, let's say, to success was, was so close. Uh, so that said, uh, I think that there's just uh, one thing I'd like to provoke, uh, and that is because the reliance on uh, existing frameworks of visibility and vision and perspective and so on and so forth in architecture were almost comical. No, they were brilliant, but they were almost comical in their uh, non-commensurability with the problem you were dealing with. I mean, frankly, you know, Slutsky and Rowe, wonderful, absolutely wonderful historical framework, but almost quaint given the, uh, the fact that we're not really dealing with photons anymore at all, but a whole, <laughs> a whole other regime, if you like, of, uh, well, of need for crypsis, but also of surveillance, of, uh, of, of violation, of penetration, and so on and so forth. So uh, I just thought that, you know, there should be um, an attempt at least, because I think you, well, you know, I think that an attempt at 
trying to begin to reconceive the problem, uh, the visibility problem or the vision problem as, you know, because from an old era, it was because we believed that vision was dominant and that we believed that vision, was, well, in a certain sense, it's a, it's a bias, it's a, it's a false, uh, it's a fallacy, but it's the bias around which so much of our understanding and our speculation about the, well, about the built environment was based, but sensing um, today and, you know, security, privacy, flying under the radar, uh, defense, uh, safety, um, you know, we're really going to the next phase, shall we say, of, um, you know, that, that it reminds me, I'm, I'm really old when I say this, I realize this, I remember when I was a kid and I heard that song of Simon and Garfunkel, and, and frankly, that goes back as, the, the song is, Oh My Grace, I've Got No Hiding Place. Um, it reminds me that, you know, for a while, uh, dip, um, what do you call these, uh, embassy architecture were anomalies in the sense that their concerns for, um, let's say, information defense uh, and was, was a special case, though it clearly is not the case any longer. Um, I read, I'm sure many of you did, the article in the New York Times a few days ago talking about how the police have become really adept at using uh, Siri and Alexa in order to, um, um, in order, you know, to, 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 uh, for crime investigation uh, because they are always on and because the records are being stored and saved. And it simply means that they can go back. I think the records are retrievable almost, well, I don't know if it's indefinitely, but for at least 90 days, they, can, uh, they ask Amazon please give us the records of so-and-so, so-and-so from a certain time. And the, the clues they get, the clues they get about the person's whereabouts and that they can then measure against their alibis is fucking terrifying. Anyway, I want that house. And I want that, um, I want that embassy. I want all that technology available to me in about five years. Thanks. We have a few I love comments. that comment. I love that comment because we have to protect ourselves. Fuck the politicians. I mean, this this should be a house. Exactly. That's very okay. But just for the sake of argument, I think the <laughs> problem is that you're assuming that that information is never tampered with. It always ends up in the right hands. Uh, and I think the problem with that is that the moment that that information is out there, is available to be transformed, manipulated, and turn into anything. So this idea again, that data is unbiased uh, and that knowing more is better. I, I think we, I don't know, for me, that's, we, we have to think differently about it. We know, we know better by now. Wow. That hyper survey I mean, I, doesn't necessarily lead us to a world of peace and order. Of Look at what's happening. It's actually quite the opposite, right? So, yeah. I mean, I would say that in some ways, your embassy when they became a theater um, for civilians in a strange way, um, and maybe that's maybe that's the pacifistic nature that Anna is bringing up, um, in that it's it's a house, in that it's a it's a theater or a house, not for the diplomats, but rather for the civilians. And it's no longer this kind of like static front um, with a very some kind of strange like iconicity, meaning it looks like uh, you know, um, Baroque you know, building or something that uh, uh, assumes power and authority. It's it's the, quite the opposite. It's something that kind of disappears and reflects the city uh, inside and outside and. Um, and is fleeting and constantly sort of changing inside and outside uh, simultaneously. And I think maybe like this strange layering um, perhaps is the pacifist nature of this, of this embassy, but also is what makes it a non-embassy precisely uh, and what makes it uh, either a, a theater, whether that's even 
with ecology that makes sense uh, today, uh, or a domestic space, I don't know. But, but it does, what you've done does definitely dissolve um, the typology of an embassy as we know it. Um, and I think that's what's interesting also about um, what you presented to us today. I would like to add one note about the, uh, the discussion about the, the political, uh, um, let's say the, let's say the radical perspective of making something which is uh, protecting the private from the uh, the power rather than the opposite. And this discussion was making me curious about one technical aspect. Is because sometimes ago uh, I was working. Uh, with images of a satellite and basically discussing with the, the, the people who are in charge of the satellite, they told me, well, the real power is from satellites. So this is where we control, uh, well, theoretically the power control everybody. So the dimension, let's say the urban dimension is more uh, community, is more of course power, but uh, let's say the, the place where we are highly controlled and under, let's say a totally, uh, Let's say our uh, privacy is uh, is uh, threatened by the power, not by other people. Is the sky? So I was wondering if uh, maybe you said, but uh, I lost some bits and pieces here and there. So did you study any possibility to have uh, also horizontal surface, or let's say some kind of way of hiding these, uh, uh, dissimulating the architecture, also sort of an envelope or something that. Uh, operate also uh, at that level, if it makes sense, the questions, Wendy. Um, I guess the part, um, the thesis where I kind of go through that is when I'm going through my material um, catalog and I'm going through all of the optical, social and cultural implications of all of these um, materials. And then also when they're on the rig. So a lot of these deal with um, both obfuscation, camouflage, and concealing, but also like indoctrination um, and, and messaging as well. Um, so I, I guess that's where, where that would come in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, sorry, I was just like um, trying to say something. I'm, I mean, first, congratulations, Wendy. I think this is an extremely well thought out and, and uh, intelligent and, and smart and critical and relevant thesis. And um, you can put all these words together. I was just like, uh, I mean, personally, I, I had a little bit of hard time somehow putting it together, but uh, I mean, as a, I know, as, as a one thing, but I think it is, and that's what I was sort of waiting and listening to other comments, because I think your the strength of your project and your thesis is in the fact that that maybe it, it doesn't still come together. It's not easily sort of uh, apprehensible as such. Uh, the medium, the techniques, the, the test, the, the sort of trial and error, the sort of multiplicity of all the artifacts that you have produced that somehow, somehow like are completely aligned with the content that you have put forward, but maybe they don't put forward like a, a at least in maybe in, in my in my mind, it may be a completely sort of finished Polish project that you could see in in in, in um, at least you could see in three or four uh, renditions in a, in a similar way uh, makes it sort of like uh, you know attractive and, and and interesting and yet sort of harder to somehow like uh, maybe commodify and I think I think that's where maybe your 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 thesis. Uh, as a kind of idea slash project uh, slash position is where it's actually is at, its, uh, at its strongest, you know, because there's a lot of, I mean, I, I could, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of uh, details, there's work at, at many different scales. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I think the topic of, uh, I, I think the topic of transparency, uh, it's an interesting one to certainly revisit. You know, it often gets sort of lost in the in the kind of annals of, of history. And uh, but I, I'm completely supportive of what you know of the kind of uh, of the sort of experiments and speculation you're doing in relationship to the 
you know, basically to the kind of perception, facade, you know, elevation of the building uh, and, and how the envelope basically hides or, or masks or, or enhances or, or reveals what's actually really going on. So um, anyway, I mean, this is maybe a little bit general. Um, it's probably one of the projects that I'd like to kind of see and review and, 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 and maybe, you know, uh, and it, for me at least would have maybe enjoyed the, the kind of a, a, a large sort of pinup and stuff in the world, but I can see, I mean, there's, there's a lot, you've done a lot and, and, and you're, you said a lot, you know, and, and I think that's what's really most important. So thank you and congrats. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, that's a great conclusion. Um, Wendy, it was a pleasure advising this summer and seeing all this unfold. Um, and thank you for the discussion. So we're gonna move on to Sam just because we're running a little bit of time. Congrats, Wendy. Sam, are you ready? Yes. Hello. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm also putting a link to the same website in the chat for my YouTube um, friends. This is the link <laughs> where all the thesis content in this presentation um, is being hosted. Hello, thank you all for joining today. My name is Sam Kaufman and I will be your virtual guide as we move through the imaged and materialized terrain of my thesis. Please use the link in the chat to navigate at your own pace. Sacred lands, health resort, naval test station, the contingent identities surrounding the Coso hot springs are in a constant state of entropy and fossilization. Tremulous formations and management agencies facilitate the stage for spiritual cleansing, material extraction, and placemaking. The thesis proposes an architecture that takes on the performance-based operations found in the art and tectonic practices of repairing and reusing broken ceramic parts at the scale of the vessel, such as in Kintsugi, and at the scale of the building, such as in Spolia. These processes were folded into scenographic performances undertaken by myself in two ways. One, molding and casting. Two, 3D scanning, and imaging. These performances are a series of visual and material experiments, a method for recycling, re-identifying the existing ruins at the chosen site in Owens Valley. Although the site is off limits to the public, documentary scenes of the hot springs were collected and interpolated as forensic data and topographical evidence. By extracting and compositing archival postcards, documentary sequences, USGS LIDAR scans. The resulting scenography is a superimposition of history with materiality, an extraction of an atmospheric yet tactile terrain. So we'll begin by looking at the rules and regulations for this project. The architecture emerges from the ruins and active geology of the Coso volcanic region. Weekends only, seven cars maximum, the complex conflates thermodynamics with cultural memory. By overlaying, cropping, and sequencing the different documents, the cultural adjacencies and contradictions of the site reveal themselves. In this document, you can find a hearing before the Committee for Indian Affairs, a tribally approved ethnographic survey, as well as a 1984 geospatial analysis conducted by NASA as the space age or as the space race was ending and different survey techniques were trialed on Earth. To begin our tour of the actual architecture, we'll start at the south end of the site by first looking at the mud pot. The historic use of the mud pot um, was a changing room in an, in an outdoor um, mud bath. In this representation, you see the scenographic reconstruction of the mud using documentary frames, as well as an old postcard superimposed. Now we'll move to the first primary structure of the site, which is the bathhouse. Historically, this ruin of the 1930s hotel 
utilizes a courtyard planimetric organizational system. I use the same um, courtyard typology as seen in this plan. However, instead of um, containing a central void, the entire building is exploded and different areas become um, partially enclosed and adaptable depending on when the building is in use. These are, um, these are photos of the plaster models that I've been developing, which utilize different types of stacking um, and different scales of fragment parts. Um, and here's a section drawing of the bathhouse, which you can see the elevated pool, which draws in cool air, releasing the hot energy through the roof. And finally, a composite in which the plaster models were photogrammetrically scanned, rendered, and superimposed. The next building on our tour will be the informal harp. Historically, um, the program for this building was a restaurant and post office. The new program utilizes the same planimetric organizational system as the precedent. The double stacked corridor um, instead spills, or using the same planimetric organization as the historical building, a double stacked corridor. Um, in this plan, you can see how the open range spills into the kitchen range. Um, the topography of both the land and the countertop surface become one. Moving um, into different sections, we can see how there are different types of wall systems and enclosure. A glazing um, allows for views of the interior elevations from within the corridor. And here is another superimposed model showing the LIDAR photogrammetric scan of the physical model superimposed onto itself. The numerous pavilions and follies which populate the site provide a provisional enclosure, exploding the existing campus ruins into a field of occupiable artifacts. Reconstruction. These material experiments document the limitations and effects of the CNC mill, a project that is then in tandem to the research and design project for the entire summer. By interviewing on the conventional molding and casting workflow, resulting casts maximize new figural and surface qualities. And these molds, which were used for ceramic slip casting, the different types of tool bits and markations, which are both um, shown in section and also in this um, planned photograph of each of the different molds. The profiles and sections of these objects were determined greatly by the parameters and um, limitations of the CNC mill. However, through the casting process, new, um, new um, figural shapes emerge. Um, so in conclusion, the thesis collapses imaging and extraction techniques to develop a model embedded with cultural memories and ephemeral effects. The metadata of the site with its sacred and sinister qualities is printed simultaneously. Thank you everyone for listening. I'm excited to hear your thoughts and comments. Thank you, Sam. Can I just, ask, just a couple of questions? Thank you. Thank you for that. I, there's a um, just this, a little bit of like signal to noise ratio there that was a little hard to follow. Um, you know, it was like this website with all of these things floating and images and background, and you're showing like plans and sections, model photographs. And I'm just, 
so you know I, I i was like oh now can we just see the project so that i mean don't it's not a criticism of your project and i know we're all sitting here doing experiments and how to present you know um and and so i'm i'm totally sympathetic with it but just in retrospect you know i, I felt wait here's what I, where did the ceramic the the slip casting ceramic in a warehouse with bags of stuff what what is that is that like your stuff is that like stock photos that's mine um it's your, that's yeah, your maybe, factory uh, i don't know if it'd be helpful to share the screen again <laughs> um <laughs> But I think I've been I've been tracking in conjunction with kind of doing this analysis of the Owens Valley site. I've been looking um, very closely at the sort of origin story of plaster and at the workflow for reproducing ceramics. And so, which by is deep alabaster, right? Is that from Al Is that plaster from alabaster? From gypsum. I wall gypsum is from is from. Okay, sorry. It's okay. Please go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Andrew, just um, to answer your question, everything on the website is produced by uh, by Sam. Uh, the content, of course, of the zine is just uh, archival. But okay. otherwise, yeah. So, just so you the, the 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 those were molds for ceramic slip casting. Then, did you actually slip cast something and make a bake you know fire a kill up? Um. Yeah, because of COVID, I haven't had access to kilns, um, but I've been able to kind of, I've been using the plaster molds that were CNC to cast and then recycle the slip and kind of make it. I have one right back here that I haven't plugged in yet. Uh, Sam, can you please reshare your screen? I think it would be useful. To yeah, have. yeah. Um, I mean, a kill, I got a kill here that, so I'm just, I'm actually just, I'm not, I'm not grilling you, I'm just curious. I'm grilling you because I'm curious. How's that? I'm not. And I wanted to see what was theatric <laughs> and what was, um, you know. So this is you. So this is me casting. Um, so mm -hmm. also throughout this project, I've been using the green screen both in the physical models and also in the renderings and representations as a way to composite historical research with the like performance of casting. And the pink slime so, flowing by your feet is just an effect. Photogrammetric mud. And you're a ceramicist by trade? I'm, um, I'm an amateur ceramicist. Yeah. I don't know how to do any of the wheel throwing, but I've done more casting. Well, that, that's like, yeah, it's not. So what, you, you, you know, do you know um, Testaccio, this hill in Rome? Could you put the oh, spelling <laughs> in the middle of Rome? And it's actually just pottery shards from like the Roman Empire. They would just empty out whatever was the olive oil and smash it there. And it's still like, this huge hill. And you can see that you would find that interesting, probably. Um. I'm not sure if this part of my process was also um, clear to everyone, but the sort of the use of the photogrammetry through found footage. And so because my site is not accessible, you have to kind of go through all these different um, proposals and like basically to the military because the site resides within the China Lake um, land ordinance. And so um, I was able to find more information on my site that was from the 1930s than contemporary Google satellite imagery. And so using, um, kind of looking at how this land was surveyed and the data was extracted to create these DEM maps, I realized that the same um, technique can be employed for extracting um, the landscape from the, from the path of an actual, um, of a camera for a movie. And so the sort of tracking shots from these different documentary scenes were fed into the computational um, framework to create these different meshes. I mean, Sam, I think there's like several things running in tandem, which is why it's taking uh, all of us a little while to um, upload all the content. 
um, mentally, but uh, could you just talk about your titles for a second? So, I mean, I guess the mud pot, the bathhouse, uh, th those are somewhat more clear, but I, I guess reconstruction is the one that is least clear to me. And maybe this is building off of Andrew's question. Yeah, I think um, the other titles are of the programs on the site and the final reconstruction sort of header um, is all about like all these molds were for reconstructing the corner detail of the um, bathhouse. And so um, the reconstruction, um, all these molds were designed digitally. There's no sort of starting object or artifact that they were making a mold from. And so the sort of void was completely generated from this sort of digital analysis. Um, and so that's where the reconstruction is coming in. There's also the sort of narrative of like how the plaster gets to the mill. So you see behind these stacks and stacks and stacks of plaster in the warehouse. Each one of these blocks is like a hundred pound bag. By the time it's milled, it's about 50 pounds. So I've kind of, um, because of COVID, I've had to kind of think about labor in a really different way because only one person could be handling a block at a time. And um, for example, like with these molds, they started to get so big, I had to actually, um, I had to drill a drain into them <laughs> so that all the slip could just pour out of the bottom. Um, and so I think that even though there are these sort of parallel tracks that the thesis exists in, the ideas of the extraction and also of, um, of recon for ideas of extraction and casting and sort of the layering of the different limitations and parameters is a way to maximize the sort of mm -hmm. And which, sorry, which corner is being reconstructed? Do you have an image of it? Oh. It's, um, It's in my previous slideshow. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's not. A, it is not in this website. Um, but you okay. can see in this facade. There's this sort of. Um, it's actually a ceramic vase, and this is like the historic 1930s detail. Um, mm -hmm. And so on the corner, it's basically been like flayed, and then it um, fits on both sides of the elevation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what the detail is modeled after. I mean, if I, sorry, John. Good to no, see go, you. go ahead. I'm just... <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I mean, thank you, uh, Sam. I think it's actually a really, I mean, I think it's a really, really interesting project. I, uh, again, not to, not to be critical, but I sort of feel a little bit like, like Andy, um, I was really trying to sort of pinpoint the, the or, or parse out the, I mean, if you could say maybe the, some essential documentation versus things that were kind of like just uh, lingering in the background. And I went to your website and it's, you know, it's very consistent. So, I mean, there's, so, so maybe I, I will try and sort of take you at face value. And I think this idea of sort of parallel narratives or uh, it's, it's important to you because you're kind of making the point about uh, of showing the project that way. And so, um, you know, just to conclude on that, I think it, it, it does get a little hard, especially when you see that there, let's say there could be no essence, uh, but there is actually, a, and not to say that plans or sections or details are more essential than maybe images or textures or pieces of found documentation of old maps or information what could gather from archives or things unloaded from the internet. Uh, but let's say to kind of, plant my flag, I will say yes, you know, I mean, at a certain point in terms of like seeing what you have made. And so uh, there's two kinds of uh, documentation that I, I sort of like, uh, I kind of came to register. I mean, one is the, the, the drawings, you know, plans and at different scales, which seem to kind of debugate, let's say there is, there is a certain tendency to, to used to be kind of referred to as the unexact, you know, the certain materiality that takes on a form that begins sort of meandering and challenge maybe the, what I think you're also kind of uh, advocating, which is some sort of uh, didacticism or, or regulation of some sort of like a, a square or, or rectangle that, that somehow affords you with, you know, something to sort of play against. And I think your project at, you know, at, at in those moments, you know, either when the, the, 
the divagation of the material, which you show examples and models, plays against walls or against the, the rectilinearity of the of the box, or it plays with like uh, I think I remember seeing a sink detail, or you know, um, I, I think it's really really beautiful and it's super super interesting, you know, and seeing that in, in the context of like you're making these experiments sort of makes you. I mean, it makes me kind of wonder what it will all sort of seem like, you know. And of course, I'm 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 a little bit like left, uh, you know, wondering or imagining because the project doesn't deliver a kind of uh, ultimate like you know image of sort of togetherness. All these things maybe exist in parallel, uh, but but and because that happens, I wonder if there isn't in some cases, let's say, there is this idea of slip casting, you know, which is like you know forming material, and then there also kind of parallelly exists the idea of the piling model, which I really like, you know, it's just a kind of more raw idea of like pulling stuff from nature and, uh, or, and, and, and I, I mean, that's maybe something that, that would maybe a kind of question that I have, whether those two things are maybe not completely, um, or how those two things sort of relate to each other. And what is, and, and what is that tendency of like the, uh, maybe of, a, of the most sort of holistic aspect of the plans or drawings as registered in the project as a whole, or even in part, but, you know, but we see Poche, we see a lot of things that are tend to put it together versus the models, which are to me a little bit more fragmentary, even when they actually maybe depicting what I tend to see as a whole, they're still a little bit more fragmentary anyway. And so I tend to associate that the city casting and so on, it's kind of more associated with certain inf influx or, or impulse to you know holism you know uh whereas the models are much more sort of fragmentary about the piles and i think those two ideas that could be seen on many ways in the project are not completely together i would argue and i will and i will see maybe that as a sort of maybe an inconsistency that needs to be somehow uh, resolved but maybe you can comment on it um you really touched on an important thing with the slip casting and ideas of holism and like how that can even be seen in the plans and the sort of symmetry that exists in the plans. Um, but I would say um, that because of my interest in um, Kintsugi, for example, and like the, the sort of practice of like taking these disparate fragments and then um, putting them back together with gold leaf to create this sort of whole um, reconstruction, is sort of how slip casting comes back in is sort of like a way of enclosure and also the sort of grout between this um, macro aggregate. So the sort of stacking would be infilled with the sort of slip cast liner. Um, I, I'm gonna uh, jump on the tail of what Marcelo just said. I, um, I really enjoy the, that sense of incompleteness and the difficulty of understanding what the whole is, even if it exists in a sense. And I saw your, you, you call them models, but I saw them more as prototypes. As I can on themselves, they have the qualities of a one-to-one -one object with their own limitations, like the stacking, and you talk about the weight of the um, of, of the module and how many people you would need to move it. And I think that transcends the realm of representation um, and that the artifact itself begins to give you a feedback uh, that then um, has consequences in some of the other media that you showed today. I really enjoy the drawings made out of dots, for example. Um, and, and you had them in a sequence. First, you show the section that looked like a very conventional architectural drawing, and immediately after, you show the, um, the dotted figures, which I couldn't understand what were the figures and what was the context, if it was a plan or a section, at what scale it was operating, and that type of ambiguity or that kind of pur purposeful erasure of like singular uh, forms of legibility. I thought it was part a part of the project that then you actually managed to make material, which I don't think it's easy. Um, so when you then show the, the, I was gonna say model, but I like the prototype with the skinny slabs that are uh, stacked. Um, if that was an effort to reconstruct the column and I was very happy to see that Zaina put the photo up because then I could put the two and two together. 
in the process of reconstruction, you created something new. And uh, so if in a sense you were, there's a, a, a type of conversation we could have in the thesis that it's about design techniques and the kinds of operations and processes that we use to find ways to design. And I think even in this process where casting requires the, 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 the reconstruction over and over of something, you, but it's a model, usually it's used as a model of uh, to uh, replicate something. But the way that uh, it took place in your thesis, it ended up producing something new. And I, I really enjoy that. And it makes me think again, that beyond the object that you created, the object itself, either the bathhouse or the column or the folly or whatever, uh, this technique is a way to understand the world, to deconstruct things, to think about materiality, processes of construction. So um, I'm, I'm trying to think the website, I don't know, maybe I'm much older than you. And in that sense, like it's like a more like a, um, a generational um, gap there. Um, like I want to see certain parts of the documents that I think go beautifully together. You know that initial animation that where you did the three-dimensional reconstructions through photographic records? That has, I think, the same grain as the dotted drawing and as the model. For me, those three are a clear sequence. And then you have the maps uh, with the sections and the last model that you cast that has a more kind of precise rather than jaggedness. And I love that a parallel process can give you those two different types of output. So I started sort of seeing behind two other lines of connection as a means to organize your own documents that I think both support the thesis quite well, uh, but that somehow produce something incredibly different. And I just find that, um, I just find that very intriguing and interesting. Yeah, I could, I could maybe pick up on a few of those things. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, congratulations for, I mean, it's a tremendous amount of work and it's also, I think a tremendous amount of physical work um, in the age of COVID, which is, we all know is really not easy uh, logistically to execute right now. So um, I think that's impressive. Um, I, w I want to say two things. One is I, I think there's um, a really uh, interesting set of kind of um, homologies at work here. That is to say, like a set of technical things that all have a kind of common origin or are related in different across different time spans. So, for example, the way in which the CNC processes, I mean, CNC, you know, com computer numerically controlled surface tooling processes literally emerged or were born out of, and here's where I might make a slight adjustment to what you're talking about. They're, they were born not out of photogrammetry, but out of the technical project to overcome the limitations of photogrammetry. That is photogrammetry as it was originally understood as practicing upon parallel aerial photographs, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we call photogrammetry today is actually a form of imaging. And so it's a misnomer in a way, but that project to develop the statistical surface, which now, of course, has become the basis of all of our software. Um, so I think, in a, in, a, in a way, your your attempt to reconstruct the landscape through the same kind of the same kind of uh, technical origins by which you then addressed the mold making um, is is a kind of um, it's a sort of like meta parallel among some of your representational techniques that's really interesting. Um, the second thing I would say really uh, relates to what Mariana was talking about, which is I think what's under addressed here, and maybe it's there, but you haven't talked about it, is um, when I zoom in on a lot of the models that you've made of the actual um, architectural objects, I, I think there's a, a, an entire conversation around um, assembly, tolerances, precision, and in particular site management. That is to say like, how 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 would if I was the site if I was the project manager on site every day, how do I keep track of all these fragments and these shards and how do I know how to align them? And so I think that the maybe the next phase of this or if if we were to think about translating from from model to building, you almost would need a parallel three dimensional model that is reconstruct that is in, in real time available on site as a kind of um, point cloud model for locating 
points of construction in space in order to construct these things that appear to be so ad hoc, but we know there's no way they're ad hoc at all because the lines of force and the translation of gravity and all that has to, has to be precisely controlled exactly because they are not standardized. They are not perpendicular. They're not flat. They're not um, their, their, their tolerances actually have to be more precise because they are irregular. And I think that's, um, that's a, an interesting question that the project raises. And I think it's a very contemporary one that obviously shows up in, uh, in, in other people's work. I mean, uh, it's something that, that for sure Anna and others have been working on for, for a while. So in that sense, I, I really enjoy the project. I, I, I agree with what people are saying. I also just want to agree with what Andrew said up front that I'm, I don't know if the website works, but I completely appreciate the attempt, uh, given that we're all working under new, new conditions right now. So maybe I'll jump in and just, uh, I mean, I think um, a lot of great comments in relation to the work and, and I appreciate um, the many different ways that you're coming at this in terms of materials. And also, I would say, um, you know, this notion of the reconstruction or extraction and reconstruction is something that uh, for me wasn't just what was happening at the last piece, but every single part of your project, right, is about reconstruction in some way. Um, and I think the ones that for me are perhaps more successful or most successful are the ones that construct something new uh, and uh, in, in the process that, um, that become less literal, right? Because the fragment comes up over and over and over again, but in different ways, right? Even the dotted drawing, which uh, that uh, Mariana was talking about, which I absolutely love as well, um, is, is putting together something through fragments. There's a moment where the plan you know, just the fact that you take um, the very precise way of drawing in architecture typically, but you use it and apply it to something that is absolutely imprecise, right? So you get this contrast of what happens when you apply that method of drawing to, um, to the kind of edge conditions uh, and you see that uh, the kind of extreme uh, within that drawing. But one of the things that's most interesting to me is moving the way in which you move back and forth between, let's say what you started with is ideas of images on the one hand and materiality on the other, right? Because you, you are often making um, those things that might be seen as imagistic uh, and therefore transparent, you turn those you, you render them opaque and you make them material by the operations that you're using. And then you do you can do the reverse, right, with those things that might be seen to be material. Uh, and, you know, it's the literal use of the idea of fragment when you construct these models, you know, which in some ways, um, I'm really interested in the last, you know, the kind of corner detail and even the idea that it's a detail, it's a fragment. Um, because in, in the end, it becomes a fragment, but not like these, the other models that you're showing, which are, in my mind, far more literal, right? You're, you're almost taking the image, right, of a fragment, as opposed to really thinking what it might become as something new. And so the parts that I'm most interested in the project are, you know, maybe the less literal moves that you're making, uh, and the ways in which you actually discover something um, that totally transforms, let's say, the use of a particular uh, mode of working, uh, the use of a material, or that shifts from something that might have been seen to be originally transparent that becomes opaque, or vice versa. Um, and I, but I think it's a really interesting uh, project, um, and I kept imagining that the idea of the fragment itself is already a, a questioning for us of the way that we understand the world or the way that we might understand architecture that we never see it in its totality, which is certainly the case in your presentation, right? All we get are these sort of fragments that we're trying to put together to make something from, uh, which I think is also interesting. Mm -hmm. And sorry, everybody, I have to leave for something else, but thank you, it's been great. Thank you so much, Ella. Bye, Ella. Nice to meet you.
Bye, Ella. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice, to see, nice to see you, Ella. Bye. I, I was really fascinated also by John's comment because uh, for sure the things that kind of speak to me are the sensibilities, Sam, that you're bringing to the to the small models that kind of put together the assembly of these awkward parts. But then when John talked about the kind of idea of site management as something that would have to be choreographed in a kind of temporal way, I think that would be an incredible thing for you to kind of respond to because um, we're seeing your processes overlaid in a kind of spatial sense, let's say certain kinds of scanning onto mapping onto planning and then as a kind of plan of action ex extended into something that's for presenting a plan through, <laughs> through the dot sketch. Um, but I think that what you are constantly doing in the background has to do with the, with the kind of processes that have very much like material and temporal responsibilities. And, and in a way, um, even just thinking through the uh, process of labeling each piece of kind of cast uh, part and bringing it to the site and depositing into some pile and figuring out how to how to excavate from the fr from the goods into the into the kind of plan of the building. I, I would imagine that it's a kind of either an Excel sheet or some sort of uh, numbering system that would have to take it into a very different um, non-visual, like non-visual regime of information management, which is probably also very close to the kinds of discussions that you and Zaina had anyway. So that the questions that I have, I guess, are how to translate all the work that you've done into, let's say like non-visual management of information rather than to translate it into the visual plan and here's my building and situated thus and such. Um, perhaps there's just like so much more that you can do at this point because the kind of the casts are so incredibly fascinating and I just can't wait for COVID to kind of <laughs> be gone already so that we can uh, actually hoist these things onto um, onto our machines and use them, right? Or, or make them so big that you need to have be six feet apart by necessity to like put it on the mill bed. <laughs> um, in any case, I, I really appreciated that, that comment and I wanted to feed you back on it. I just, uh, can I say, can I say quickly that I, I, I fully agree with what Anna said, but while you were staying on that image of that deconstructed corner, I was like, I still want to see you try do the drawing. Just because I think that exercise of figuring out how our orthographic representations are so insufficient to um, capture and document the uh, the formal, geometrical, spatial reality of what you're doing actually in three dimensions and in space. I think there might be again, um, a combination of um, formats and notational systems um, that are not just singular, because of course, I'm sure you could share the CNC files or the 3D that you um, did to produce the mold or things like that. But somehow that still falls short in terms of um, architecture. So it's, it's almost like there's two versions that I'm thinking of this. One, where you need 10 drawings to represent a singular thing, right? Uh, 10 drawings of different kinds. Of, often we need 10 drawings to represent one thing, but of different kinds. Like again, the CNC, the point cloud, uh, the 3D scan, the, you know, so on and so forth. Or there's also a version where there is some type of um, corruption of notational systems in the effort to capture what you're doing with the architecture. And uh, I don't know, maybe again, that's like a personal interest, but there's something uh, there which is like, I know drawing the plan would have a really hard time to register everything that is happening, but I still want to see you try. Because when I look at this one that you have on the screen right now, I don't think that's it. You know, I think that maybe takes on a little bit kind of the landscape and the accumulation of strata and the way they understand the incremental representation to, you know, to represent slope, for example. But that's not what your pieces are doing because you still have some sharp edges. And so, I don't know, what does that drawing look like? I think it's a super interesting question. I think it's really interesting what you're saying, Mariana, because at, at some point in the summer, I almost ha had to kind of 
force Sam to put on his orthographic hat, which is deeply ironic that I would be asking this, but, uh, but it, and there was a little bit of protest where, where Sam showed me the plans and then had the architect, literally the architect hat on. Um, so this is, this is sort of a second attempt, I would say, at trying to represent this deeply kind of, um, again, dynamic and fleeting project. Like it's a project that doesn't have the corners that orthography is used to, doesn't have the kind of like tectonic systems that maybe some aspect of orthography can represent. And so I agree, I'm not, uh, I don't think this attempt definitely makes, uh, makes it legible, but it's better than the first one in that it's, it's, it collapsed <laughs> the kind of computational process of 3D scanning and the, 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 the data that comes out of it um, into something that is much more nostalgic um, uh, and, and more technical. And it's an attempt at trying to weatherize these things as well. So like, I agree, they, they are prototypes. And for a while, we've been trying to take them very seriously to say, well, could they be occupied? Or is there glass? Like very asking very kind of mundane questions. Um, and, and I personally, that's what I find exciting is that the project could be pushed towards uh, architecture and kind of capital A. Um, we absolutely looked at Ensemble uh, studio, uh, yeah, that was one of the precedents, and and their kind of incredible way of taking these ideas into um, architecture. Uh, we have to conclude. So uh, this is sort of, I would say, my conclusion that um, it's a real pleasure to work with you, Sam, and and I agree with John that it was um, kind of amazing that you were able to do all this physical work of your thesis, the casting um, and the size of things. Uh, and your, but also your ability to experiment. And I think there's a lot of uh, aspects in your project that were kind of open-ended, uncertain. Um, none of it phased you. Uh, you never knew where you were headed. You never knew what uh, the experiment was gonna lead to the next and how and what kind of things will come out of it. Um, but I really appreciate it that in the end, your thesis produced, a, again, a methodology that you could hopefully take on further in your career. So congratulations. And on that note, thank you so much to our guests, Mariana, Alessandro, Marcelo, Andrew, John, um, Matt earlier, Sanford, and uh, Ayla. Um, and congratulations to the students. Hope to see you yeah. all. Congratulations all time. soon. And I'm just going to text. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, sure. turn your videos on. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a group okay. photo. Or I guess a screenshot. Up first or group photo? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. And thank you to everybody for coming today. Thank, thank you so you. much. That was a great um, so thanks, nice for nice thanks for having us and congratulations yeah. to see the work. Thank you for having us. Bye guys. Good job. Bye. Nice to see everyone. Bye. Soon in person. Thank you, Alessandro.